everybody. Welcome to today's live stream. Uh, once again, answering DNA tests and genealogy questions. Looks like we've got a little bit of a lighter crowd starting out today than we usually have, but I uh, want to welcome everybody here. Uh, I do see we have a good amount of comments. I did ask if, uh, if you could let us know where are you uh, coming in from. Uh, so just going through a few. We have Patsy again from uh, England. We have Callum from Edinburgh. We have Gary from Italy. We have Alexandra here who's coming from Germany. Um, let's see. Sajuka, hope I'll be able to watch this stream without interruptions. Otherwise, there have been a lot of air raid signals in the Kiev region lately, and I have bad internet in the shelter. Yeah, hope every hope you're doing well in Kiev. I know things are really difficult out there, so I hope you stay safe. Uh, we've got Gary Santa Rosa, California, have an appointment, so we'll hopefully watch later rejoin. Well, that's the beauty of these. They're recording. You can always watch later. We've got Leonardo from Las Vegas, Redhead Redemption. Well, hello, another ginger in the chat. Great to see. Uh, we've got someone from Oslo. Not going to try to pronounce the name, assuming that that's actually a name. I'm guessing it's a lot of like YTS Tigto or who knows. All right. Sonia from Germany in uh, the Saxony region. We have Karma again from uh, Nebraska. Drea again from Massachusetts. Lots of uh, uh, familiar names. Oh, and Redhead Redemption coming from Oklahoma. So yeah, we really have uh, we have everyone coming from all over the place. So let's. Uh, oh, there we go. So let me pull up the Reddit. So just uh, I guess a couple of housekeeping things. I don't know if it'll be that much of a thing today since we have such a light crowd. Um, but I do try to answer, uh, the questions that are coming through chat, but I can't guarantee that I will answer them unless it is a question through a super chat. And I will try to make sure I get all of those super chats. Uh, but you know, if you have questions, feel free to post in the chat. I'll, I, I will try to get to them. We'll be going through all of our, uh, Reddit questions. Well, not all of them. <laughs> That'd be a 50 hour stream. We're going to go through a lot of Reddit questions in the last, uh, live stream. I mentioned that the way that I'm going to start doing it is a little bit different uh, than I was start than I was originally. So originally I started out going from the oldest question, coming to the newest, and then doing a few interesting ones I saw here and there. Instead, what we're going to be doing is we'll first be looking at questions that in the past two weeks or so have had the most upvotes. So this is a way for me to allow you, the audience, to choose which questions you think should be in uh, in, in rotation for the week. So um, I'm going to take a look at those and uh, hopefully have a few good ones uh, lurking at the top. Um, oh, I see the numbers are going up, so that's always good. Um, but uh, let's... Why won't I... There it is. Okay. So I need to get <laughs> I need to get my computer set up. I was uh, I was running a little bit later than I usually do today and getting everything done. Got up a little later and then right before the stream started, like literally right as I was about to hit the button to turn the 30 second thing on, my dad started calling me. I'm not sure what he needed. I picked up and just said, hey, about to start the stream and then hung up on him. So if hopefully it wasn't anything important. Um, but let's I just need to. Make it so you all can actually kind of see what it says. There we go. All right. I think that looks that looks okay. <laughs> okay. So um, let's go to the actual Reddit. So. All right, so we're going to look at our top posts, and we'll do for this month. So unfortunately, what this means is that older posts won't necessarily um, <laughs> be showing up here. Um, and I imagine also by doing this, it's going to be showing us the newest posts. So any post that I don't really see that many upvotes on or something low, I'll just kind of leave as a 
for a later time. So like this one Finnish ancestry, we'll probably do it a later time, but like these questions up here, um, yeah, we'll do that. Speaking of which, since we have this, the 2023 end of year survey, if you haven't done it yet, be sure to do it. Uh, I'm doing that to get a lot of information that's just, you know, fun to see what my audience is like, the very active audience, but also to figure out what you all would actually like best. Cause you know, the better content that I put out that actually is something you all enjoy, the better. So we're going to start with where do I look now? Um, and let me just double check. I don't have uh, too many messages I'm missing first. Yeah, we got a lot of messages coming in. Uh, just just so we can say hi, we've got Stephen Millsap, who, who's been in a lot of the streams coming in from North Dakota. Uh, oh, I'm your favorite genealogist. That's awesome to hear. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We have Jessica coming in from Canada. Maven, a very, very common uh, person on these streams. In fact, in a lot of my streams. Uh, first stream after my laptop started on fire. Wow. All right. Well, hello. And then, uh, yeah. All right. Let's uh, get to the question. So where do I look now? My husband's great grandparents immigrated from Grodens, now Grodziads. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that right. I apologize. In Poland, docking at Baltimore, Maryland, and settling in Chicago, Illinois, 1893. There are several other Pafelski families in Chicago that time that seem to be related to each other but not to our family. So I'm guessing Pafelski must be the family name because they didn't mention it before. Um, I looked at microfilms of Catholic records in Grodens and found three of their four children buried in Poland before they came to America. I did not find the fourth child, don't know the gender, nor did I find their marriage record. Help, where should I look now? Now, in terms of where to look now exactly, this is something that you'll want to discuss with uh, a few types of researchers. And, you know, I'll talk about some things that I know from my side of things, but this is one of those research questions where it's a matter of you need to seek out people who know these communities. So if you can find something online of people, like especially on Facebook, there's a lot of great genealogy groups. I would look for something that shows this Grodens, Grudziads, Poland, like people that research there. You can often find genealogy groups. Um, you know, let me see if I can even find any. Uh, so the other thing is, is you may find it for the specific town, but if not the specific town, knowing the region that they're from. Um, let's see, that's the northern part, not too far from Gdansk, Askeley. Um so one of the things that you can also do, and I talked about this on a previous stream, is Family Search has a wiki that often has a lot of great information. And so that's a great place to start to figure out where you're going. Now, and usually what I do is I'll do a... Um, I'll do a... Google search, basically, I'm trying to switch my screen so you all can see it. I'll, I'll do a Google search. So here you can see the Google search I did. So familysearch.org, wiki, and then whatever you're searching. So I put the name of the town. And often it'll be the wiki that pops up. But interestingly, here we have these Roman Catholic parish registers of baptisms in that area. And I'm looking back at this person's question just to just to double check so they looked at microfilms of catholic records so it's possible that these might be the records that they were looking at um but this is just something interesting that even googling looking for that wiki we found this instead and so for those unfamiliar this is a cataloged uh set of records so instead of being searchable which it looks like some of them are searchable uh because that's what we have here um, not all of them are searchable, but you can see them. And so with catalog records, uh, yeah, complete catalog entry of the title you selected. And basically it may not all be indexed, but they are going to have this information. And I don't know the breakdown of these 
over here, Taufin, here it's Toad. Do they say anything about? Yeah, I'm not sure. So if one of these stands out where it's like, okay, that's where I'd expect my family to be, well, then you'd want to look. And if, if they have the search function, great. You can then do the search and it'll, you know, pull it up here and then you can just search by name. So what was it? Pafelski? Was that right? Yeah, Pafelski. So, um, I mean, I now Polish is not a uh, specialty of mine. I have done very little Polish research, even for Polish Jews. I've done very little, so I, I'm not very knowledgeable when it comes to Poland. Uh, Polish names and things like that. I do know ski basically means, you know, son of, it's a patronymic sort of thing, kind of like, uh, you know, in um, a lot of uh, Ukrainian names, you get of or uh, vich, uh, things like that. So patronymics, matronymics, things like that. Uh, so we, we, we do have uh, all of these different options um, in terms of those books before, but the thing that I really wanted to show, and I'm going to see if I can find it, is that, that wiki page. Assuming they have one for this town, if they don't have one for the town necessarily, they may have one for that region, which I guess, let's see, what's this region? Bedag. I'm not going to try to pronounce that. Uh, okay, here we go. So, oh, this is the family search center. So this was the region that that town was in. And then doing the wiki, we had a few things coming up. So there's a family search center there, apparently. So that might not actually be too bad of an idea to reach out to them and see if they can give you guidance or, you know, help you uh, understand Uh maybe a little bit more of what's going on here. We have the wiki and now I can tell kind of why we weren't finding that much. This is very short. This is a very small wiki for what I often see on family search. Um, but we do say, you know, go over here for uh, information, instruction, and important links to apply to the 1966 uh, void ship of that. Um, so there's just, you'll have to read through this to see what's going on. Um, you know, from a wiki standpoint, this is what's considered a stub. I don't know if they call stuff stubs on regular family search. I used to be a Wikipedian for anyone who, who didn't know. Um, so, but this is just a short article. So just a few things that you could do um, in terms of records. But now going back to the question, um, there's a few other things that you can do beyond just records. And that main thing is, DNA. So for one, you say that you found these several other families in Chicago <clears throat> seem to be related, but can't really tell based on the records. Obviously, if they're in Chicago from that area with the same name, there's two possible two main possibilities. Obviously, there's a lot of possibilities, but two main possibilities. One, they are the same family from the same area you know, this town gradens and then they all moved to Chicago because they were all relatives and they knew their relatives were in Chicago. Another thing, another possibility, and this may be something you need to look into the history of the migration of people from this town is to see were there a large contingent of people from this town moving to Chicago. Um, and if that's the case, it's also a possibility that even though these families have the same name, it may not be the same actual family because they may have adopted them around the same time. I don't know the history of surnames in Poland, but overall in a lot of Eastern Europe, it was basically patronymics for, for many, many years up until mostly the 1800s, largely having to do with Napoleon's conquest because he enacted civil registers and things like that everywhere he, he took over. Um, but you can... Um, you know, understanding that history, you can then understand the possibility of, well, is the Pofelski name something that might be going back hundreds of years, you know, more than hundreds, like 400, 500, you know, you could trace that name back into the 1700s or 1600s or yeah, something like that, as opposed to, is that a name that you really only can trace back to the 1800s? 
And if that's the case, and they're coming from a population group that only had patronymics up until the 18 on or yeah, up until the 1800s, you have a higher chance that these are just different families that took the same name. If that, I hope that makes sense. I feel like the way I went about explaining that was a little bit around. So there's two possibilities. And you can look through the records and try to find it. And, you know, you may find records that connect things, but then you're still always dealing with that issue of having to have enough correlating information to confirm it's the right people and not just multiple people with the same name. Because if it is the case that we said that multiple families in that town or that region took that same name, but they weren't related, it's also likely that they may have also named many of their children similar first names. So that, that's something you need to look into. And this is actually an issue all, of, all across genealogy, but especially in, in places like that where surnames are a much more recent adopted thing. Um, in a video that I did not too long ago talking about that book, The Jewish Pirates of the Caribbean, a big part of me debunking it, which I, I say me debunking it, but really it's working off of the work of Tone Thielen. Um, you know, I did a little research and working on a lot of that stuff, pulling up records, but a lot of that thesis really came from tone. And um, with that book, a lot of it is relying upon bad genealogy where the author took multiple people and turned them into one person. And that's what my video does is it shows the genealogy and the records to prove that they were different people. Um, so this is a very common issue. Short story long, <laughs> basically what you could do is do DNA testing. So have your husband do a DNA test and then see if you can find living descendants of this Pafels these other Pafelski families and see if they're willing to DNA test. As well, connecting with them might be helpful just in asking, hey, what do you know about your ancestry? We might be related. Here's the, or my husband might be related. Here's the information I have on his family is there anything you know that connects into it? So it's kind of twofold in, in reaching out. Um, so with that DNA, if you do the DNA test and they end up matching at the expected amount, then that that kind of leads credence to your, um, your theory, your hypothesis. It doesn't necessarily prove it. Uh, it's one step towards proving it. You still have to do more and confirm with records and, you know, because DNA has its issues and you may be related, he might be related to them, but it might end up being through a different line that you didn't even think about. Um, especially if they're also coming from the same towns, because that means that even if their Pafelski ancestry isn't the same, they may have similar ancestry to each other. Um, all right, let me take a look at, uh, let me take a look at what, uh, comments are coming through, if any. Um, so I see a lot of people saying where they're from. We have Italy, Iran, Michigan, Kerry, North Carolina, Canada, Netherlands. And uh, yeah, yeah, we've got we've got a lot of people. We've got people on uh, YouTube, Facebook, Twitch. Yeah, we've got a lot of stuff. Speaking of which, um, I am streaming through Facebook through Twitch and through YouTube. So if you're watching through one, but you also have an account on one of those other platforms, uh, I truly appreciate it. if you go to that other platform, follow me there, subscribe, like, or whatever. Um, it certainly helps me out. And uh, especially on Twitch, if you're on Twitch, I need a lot of people going over there and chatting live. So if you're on Twitch, would love to have you jump over there and start chatting. Um, granted, YouTube's actually where I make the money. So it's kind of funny to send people away from the one that makes me money right now. But either way, that it, it helps. Just watching helps. So great. So, all right. So hopefully, hopefully a lot of what I suggested is helpful for this person if they're watching. Um, they only posted this two weeks ago. So it's very possible. Uh, Grand Mappo. Grand Mapo, they've uh, they've been on uh, Reddit for a while, so we're gonna go ahead and mark that reviewed, and let's jump to the next question. Um, so this was the next most upvoted question. This is from 25 days ago, so this was posted um, almost a month ago. Yeah. All right. So hi, I recently did a test on my heritage, but I'm now interested in my haplogroups. Is there some sort of site where I can upload my DNA file and get my haplogroup 
or do I need to buy a new test at 23andMe, for example? And then, um, oh, it's a cross post. They posted it elsewhere. I was like, wait, what is, this is the same thing right there. Okay. Now I'm going to take a look through what the comments say uh, first, um, partly because it, it might be possible, but I'm not 100% sure. And I'm trying to see if somebody actually kind of knew. Um, let's see. Um, okay, let me, I just want to check what comments they have over here. Okay, yeah. So this is this is this is what I was looking for because I, I was pretty sure that this was the case, but not a hundred percent sure. And basically, what it is is that even though they don't give you the information on Y chromosome or mitochondrial DNA, sometimes these tests are still testing those DNA markers. So here, Mini Cooper Love uh, said there are some third-party options that will provide a haplogroup based on the Y or MT DNA data included in some autosomal DNA tests. However, last I knew, my heritage does not include any MT DNA, mitochondrial DNA, and they only include about 482 Y SNPs if you're male. So this is how you figure out a haplogroup, which probably isn't enough to get a reliable haplogroup from, which is very true. And one of the reasons why most of the autosomal tests don't really give that is because they need to test for a decent amount of uh, Y markers to be able to confidently say it's this haplogroup or that haplogroup. And even then, those haplogroups are very uh, vague haplogroups. I mean, they've gotten better, but, you know, like for a while on 23andMe, my haplogroup was just H. And then eventually it finally became H1 for my mitochondrial. So, okay. So... Uh, so I wouldn't bother with this if you tested at my heritage. It would be better to retest elsewhere. Yes, um, haplogroups generally aren't very useful for recent genealogy, but if you really want to know them, 23andMe is a good place to start. Start being the key word here because if you want in depth, you will need to test through Family Tree DNA. Let's see if they say that. Among the autosomal DNA tests, 23andMe includes the most Y and mitochondrial DNA SNPs. And you don't have to upload to a third party to get them. A full Y and or mitochondrial DNA test from Family Tree DNA would probably be more useful. Very much agree. It'd be the most useful because they include matches, but they are more expensive. And 23andMe's Y haplogroups are often actually further downstream than FT DNA's Y STR tests. Now, this last sentence, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, that's not something I've ever looked into. It's kind of an interesting thing to, to say, and maybe I'll look into that and see how true that is. Although I guess in my own experience, I've always felt that it was kind of the opposite way that, you know, if you do one of the family tree DNA YSTR tests, you usually get a more downstream haplogroup than from 23andMe, but it's possible that may have changed. Um, it really depends on the SNPs that they're testing versus STRs. And so there's a lot of things to talk about here. So Number one, yes, there are third-party sites to do that. I can't remember any of them. Let's see if anyone lists any. Um, okay, yeah, YSeq was one. Um, not sure if YFO was. I want to say, wasn't there, was it? Let's see. I'm going to, before I say it, say it out loud, I want to make sure. Yeah. Um, okay, yes. So stevemorse.org is a website where you can do that. Um, changing my screen. So this is this is the Steve Morse website. So basically uh, you can put in information of these markers. So each of these is a, uh, it, it's a, um, an allele, I think is technically what it'd be considered or a marker. Or, I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure this is getting into the actual genetic, genetic stuff, which I mean, I'm, I'm pretty good at, but um, basically these are the different STRs and they're all labeled something different. And an STR is a short tandem repeat, meaning that when you're looking at the DNA, there are certain places where certain sequences repeat. And when they look at that area, they can determine based on how many times it repeats 
the connection between people. So here at this uh, STR, these are the options of what type of repeats you might see. So you have to figure out how to actually go and look at that information. Um, it says that it's really only for family tree DNA. So I don't know if you could use 23andMe with it, but it certainly is possible. Um, let's see, because the Steve Morse website has a lot of stuff to it. And <laughs> that's why I was like, wait, let me look and make sure I'm not just sending people this site. And then they're going to be like, wait, I can't find anything. Um, so there's like a, there's a lot of stuff on here. So if you've never been to Steve Morse, check it out. There's a lot of cool stuff. This was a really, really hot website, especially when I first was getting started. Um, I feel like it's been around for the longest time. Slowly over time, it's kind of become less and less useful because so much of this is just available elsewhere and in a more modern uh, version. I mean, this is very like early 2000s type of website. Um, so, yeah, let's see. I'm just going to check uh, chat real quick, see uh, what we've got. Um, okay. We have a few questions I'll get to in a second. Um, okay. So, let's see. DNA. So family tree DNA markers, haplogroups. Ah, okay. So we might have just been on a different page. No, this is the same page as before. Okay, so yeah. So not 100% sure if you can do it. Now there are other websites. And if you really, really want to get into the, the depths of it, I would suggest going on to Facebook and joining one of the genetic genealogy groups, um, genetic genealogy tips and techniques uh, that's run by Blaine Bettinger is probably one of the best groups out there on Facebook for genetic genealogy. So that could be a good place to go and ask about more than likely. There's probably already a thread from years ago that goes into all sorts of information. Um, but going back to the question, Da, 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 da. So we'll go back to the question on my page. So, um, yeah, so there definitely is a way to get a haplogroup from 23andMe, assuming that that, uh, or sorry, my heritage, uh, assuming that what the person that uh, over here, let me give them Mini Cooper Love, I feel like I've seen them else on, on these threads a lot. Uh, basically, Assuming that they are correct, that they that my heritage is giving Y SNPs, you may be able to go on some of these websites and get some sort of a haplogroup. But if you want to get a better prediction of a haplogroup, doing a 23andMe test would probably be the simplest route to just get a basic haplogroup if you if that's what you want. But if you are looking to make this as genealogically useful as possible. I would suggest doing a family tree DNA Y kit. And when it comes to those kits, there's different options. There are the low options that are just STR markers. So the short tandem repeats we we're talking about. And then there's what's known as the big Y, which is then doing pretty much the entire thing. Not everything, I think. I think there's some they leave untouched, but it's doing a lot of the STRs and the SNPs. There are other options in between, like you can buy the YSTR kits and then you can buy specific SNPs, or at least you used to be able to. I'm not 100% sure if you still can. If someone knows, post uh, post a comment, but at least it used to be where you could buy YSTR kits. You could have a Y67, meaning they're testing 67 STR markers and then buy special SNP packages after that to try to determine your what's known as a terminal SNP, basically a SNP that only you and a certain amount of other people are sharing. And based on where that SNP is and the other information they know, it then allows them to create a, um, a, a new haplogroup that's further downstream, which is then uh, uh, known as a subclade, basically. So um, just to give a idea of that, 
here's my Y DNA uh, haplo group. So I am right here. So this is me. And so this is my, my most defined subclade is myself and this person. Our subclade formed around a thousand years ago or so. So the terminal SNP that we have is the one that formed about a thousand years ago. So YBP years before present. So they give a range here. It could have been as far back as, gosh, show it. <laughs> it does not want to stay. Maybe that's the easier way. No, it's not. There we go. Okay. So formed a, on a 95% uh, uh, <laughs> accuracy, I guess you could say. I don't think that's the right term, but close to the thing. Between 1,450 years to 475 years before present, that was when this terminal snip of ours happened. Basically, there was, whenever that was, there was a man that lived back then who had a son and that son, there was a mutation in his DNA, and that mutation is what myself and this person are inheriting, and thus how we know that we are from the same subclade. And then even though that's when the terminal SNP was created, based on the information we have, our most recent common ancestor to 95% accuracy lives somewhere between 600 to 75 years before present. So I've tried contacting this person, have not heard back, which is a big disappointment. But the thing is, is when you're looking at 200 years before present, well, that's what, 18, early 1800s. And for me, on that side of my family, I actually have it traced back to a person who would have, an, a male ancestor who would have been alive at that time. So if I were able to get in touch with this person, we might be able to, our link might be just one generation back behind that, or it might even be that same generation. So this is, would be what I'd call a genealogically significant match. And that's the benefit of doing the more advanced Y-DNA testing. Um, now, granted, mine is doing it through what's known as a whole genome sequence test, which is where instead of doing, you know, just Y DNA or just autosomal DNA or just mitochondrial DNA, whole genome is doing the whole shebang. It's getting everything, even all of the markers that in your autosomal tests, like the typical ancestry 23 me and all that doing more than what they do. So they're only doing what's known as those SNP markers. They're only doing about 600 to 700,000 SNP markers, which is only a tiny percentage of your entire genome, but a whole genome test is doing the whole genome. So that's, I did a whole genome and uploaded through Y full, but this just gives you a good idea of kind of the idea of subclades. So this is our subclade. Then we have this, there's this other subclade here of this person that you know, they do not have this terminal SNP, which that's what the SNP is called. JFT101167. So that's that's our, our subclade. But then the next subclade up is with this guy and estimated about the same formation of when it formed, you can see, but because of different, how much we're matching with our SNPs and our STRs, even though this is a formed similar amount of time, our most recent common ancestor is further back. So instead of having it averaged out to 200 years before present, it's 950. And then we can keep going back. And so now we're part of that subclade, but then we're part of these three separate ones that are coming from this that form further back. And then you just kind of keep going. And so what this is, this is a family tree and you can even look at it basically like a family tree. So this is the, you know, this is the thing about why DNA is it's literally using DNA to create a family tree. And that's what haplogroups are is haplogroups are breaking that ma massive family tree into little sections. And so you have your overarching one. So like I come from J2. You can see going down that line, I'm just going to go back so you can see it. So you can go down the line. So this is each subclade under each. And then when I did my testing through family tree DNA, the Y67, I had JM257, I think it was, which is basically J2. And so with J2, you can see how much that covers. 
And when we actually go up, we, we need to here. Well, we're going to do the classic chart because <laughs> looking at this one as a family tree, there's just too much. But so we can see with J2, okay, JM102. So there's there's a few different ones, but we're looking at th over 30,000 years ago, at least over 25,000 years. Ago. So this goes back real far. So that's why when you're just getting these generalized haplogroups, these vague haplogroups from 23andMe or from my heritage if you can do that or doing you know these little trick websites like steve morse and all of that it really isn't genealogically useful because i mean twenty thousand years ago i mean even if it was for the ones that are two thousand years ago um so like like here go back to the classic chart so like here i mean we're looking at thirteen thousand years ago um, let's see if I can find my, okay. So here's mine actually funny enough. So we can go up and we can see, and this is what's really interesting too of Hopple group. So take a look at this. So here we have it where we have all of these people where they're coming from Jewish ancestry. And you can tell because over here it says Yiddish. So basically what these countries indicate is tracing up their paternal line. Where was their oldest known patrilineal ancestor living and what were they speaking? So for me, they're living in the Chernivsky uh, Oblast in Odessa, uh, not in Odessa, in uh, Ukraine. So specifically, they're living in a town called Sokorani, uh, north, right north of the current Moldova border, border with Ukraine. And they spoke Yiddish. And then all of these different ones, well, this one's U.S. They may not know they have Jewish ancestry on the patrilineal line, but you can see tracing up all of this Jewish Yiddish, Yiddish, and even if it says Hungarian or something like that, they're in areas that were common to have a high amount of Jewish uh, ancestry. And even more, once we get here, we see Libya, Judeo-Arabic. So this person likely, even though they're from Libya, they're coming from a um, Jewish ancestry. So probably a Mizrahi Jewish ancestry. And then we get further back and then we get people coming from Qatar and Saudi Arabia. We have someone from india and then we keep going back we have libya libya iraq and then this is our big group right here and so this jz42941 well let's look at their quote-unquote siblings and where their their descendants are and then we notice it's basically a lot of middle eastern or mediterranean so we have italy hungary armenia syria armenia yemen yemen saudi arabia kuwait kuwait iran saudi arabia Italy, Great Britain, Russia, I mean, so, you know, it's not always going to be exactly the same, but very similar. And then here we see Palestinian, 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 Palestinian. So this is, I just wanted to show this because this is, you know, for all the people right now that are going on and on about, you know, Jews are not from the Middle East, DNA proves it conclusively. They, there is a strong connection. And what we can see with this subplay that I am coming from, that all of these people that are Jewish, we see that this formed right about 5,000 years ago, which is very interesting because if you know what year the Hebrew calendar is in, it's not too far off. And the most recent common ancestor lived probably about 1,650 years ago. Granted, there's a range. And most likely they were living in the Middle East. And when we look at their closest subclades, which is this one where they're from Qatar, we can see that it's a similar thing where they're all coming from this ancestry here that was about 7,300 years ago, 5,200 years ago. So basically 50 or sometime about, you know, between a couple of thousand years ago, there was somebody in the Middle East who likely then became Jewish um, for whatever reason, because, you know, Jews didn't always exist once they existed you know, people had to become Jewish. And so that's kind of where that split off happens. So basically every, almost everyone that seems to descend in this block seems to have Jewish ancestry. But then when we look at the others, they seem to have some sort of North African or uh, Middle Eastern ancestry, basically, you know, within that typical kind of Muslim world. Um, so it's just, just very interesting in terms of the Y DNA. So you can really see from a, basically a family tree point i mean this is just looking at a family tree of just one line for everybody so you know we all trace up our paternal lines we all look at our father's 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 father and we do that for thousands of years and eventually we find 
one man that we all descend from. So, okay. <laughs> I think I've been going on and on and on and on and on for this one. I Hopefully you all are enjoying that. Um, now I actually need to get back to that. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Now we want to mark this. Reviewed. Apply. And then... go back. All right, let's check messages. And I know we had a few questions that I figured I'd answer. Ah, I see the numbers have gone up a little bit. That's good to see. Um, all right. So Stephen Millsap, is it worth taking ancestry DNA test over to my heritage, family tree, living DNA, etc., Or is it better to get each of their own tests? Now, this is actually kind of an interesting question in a few ways. Um, but overall, I think the answer is really going to be it's not that worthwhile to test directly with them um, unless you're really into the admixture stuff. Um, but if you're doing that, if you're just trying to get into those databases specifically for the genetic matches so that you can identify your family, expand your family tree, do that sort of thing, it's not going to make that much of a difference. But if you do care about the admixture, it may make some of a difference. And the reason is, is because while each of these DNA tests are largely testing the same SNP markers. So just a reminder, all of these tests are, are testing about 600 to 700,000 SNP markers, your autosomal SNP. Uh, SNPs standing for SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism. And with these tests, even though they're all testing largely the same amount of SNPs, they aren't all testing the same SNPs. So there may be some that do have a larger overlap, and then there each company may have specific SNPs that only they're testing that none of the other companies are testing, or only one of the other companies are testing. Um, so when they're doing their algorithms to create the admixture, the ethnicity calculators, then it's going to be slightly different if they're going to be testing different markers that they're using for that reading. So, you know, if you test with my heritage and let's just go with a clean number, 700,000 SNPs, let's say, or let's, let, let's just say ancestry. Cause that's what you said. So ancestry test 700,000 SNPs, every, every test clean 700,000 SNPs you upload it to my heritage, but there's only 650,000 of those SNPs that my heritage actually tests for. And then on top of that, there's another 20,000 that my heritage tests that Ancestry didn't test. So you're looking at 50,000 SNPs in your Ancestry test that aren't going to be used by my heritage. And then another 20,000 SNPs my heritage is looking for that you're not going to have. So when they give you your admixture results, it's going to be different because it's not being able to use its full potential because there's a whole bunch of SNPs that are missing that it would use to, to figure things out. And there's a whole bunch of other SNPs that aren't useful for it. And so if you want to get the most out of a company's admixture or their health traits or the, uh, you know, the, the non, <laughs> the non genetic genealogy stuff, really, then it may be useful testing at that company just so you can get the test to, properly analyze the way that they were designed to analyze. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, but yeah, just to, if you're just looking for doing this to get your genetic matches, I think you, it's just worth uploading. Now I will say this is actually, this is something that's crossed my mind before. It's a question that has come a, across, across my desk a few times. And it's something that I was looking at possibly doing a video of um, using one of my YouTuber family tree guests as the test subject where I'd actually have one, I'd have them test at multiple places and then upload their results to the different sites and then kind of compare what are the differences between each. Um, so, and that's also not considering that each test, when, when they do the readings of the DNA, when they try to read each 600, 700,000 markers, there's a 1% margin of error. And 1% margin of error at 700,000 is 7,000 SNPs being read incorrectly. Um, so you also have that on top of all of the other parts where 
you're, it, it just complicates things. So, yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Scott Lee Gibson, 23andMe sent me a V5 chip upgrade to take a new sample. Do you think it will change much? And what new things can I expect with the new chip upgrade? Now, I'm not 100% sure what you can expect with the new chip upgrade. Um, I think it's going to be kind of a very similar answer to the one that I just gave in terms of with all of their calculators for the admixture, the ethnicity uh, calculators, the health traits and all of that. Um, it's going to give you better answers because that's what their system is geared towards is having the V5 chip. And I'm not 100% sure. I'll have to look. Let me see. Because um, I think with the V5 chip and the V4 chip, um, it's basically just kind of a matter of uh, the SNPs that they're looking at. So let's see. Um, so let's see. Was, is it Illumina or Mid Journey? No, that's something different. <laughs> okay, so I'm just double checking the difference because I'm sure 23andMe has a page that, that describes. Okay, here we go. So this, this kind of breaks everything down, but they have the key information for it. So uh, currently chip upgrades are only available for customers who are genotyped for the V1 through V4s. Um, you do have to pay for it. And then let's see. Oh, it doesn't say. Okay, so I guess this is, this is kind of what you get. There's more reports that you get with it. Um, but um, the main thing I'm trying to see is, are they testing more SNPs? Because I've actually, I've never looked in depth into actually like what the exact difference between them are. Um, I did know that you're basically kind of limited on certain reports and then other reports you may not get as um, strong of results. So yeah, if anyone knows, post in the comments, do they test more or, or more SNPs because I was pretty sure that was kind of part of it is they're testing more SNPs. Yeah, they don't even say SNP. <laughs> Single report. No, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> but uh, hopefully that answers your question. All right. Uh, we've got some more people coming in. Hi from UK. Hello from North Carolina. Um, Ah, Drea, I'm in that group, Genetic Genealogy Tips and Techniques. It's a great group. DNA Detectives is a great one too. Although DNA Detectives is specifically geared towards identifying unknown ancestry, basically, um, you know, adoptee cases, NPE cases, unknown parentage, things like that. Um, uh, what's the name of the group? Yeah, Gen uh, Genetic Genealogy Tips and Techniques. Yes, okay. All right. I'm just reading through a few. Okay, I'm a true genealogist. It's all about the matches. Yeah. So you definitely don't need to. Okay, test it on V3. So yeah, if you're going to jump from V3 to V5, I imagine um, in terms of the reports and all of that, it'll give you a lot more. In terms of the genetic genealogy, I don't know uh, if there's a significant benefit to it. But I imagine that there would be a benefit in terms of when it's comparing you to other V5 testers in their database. Um, huh. What are your thoughts on the police are stealing your DNA video? Same as your thoughts on the Illuminata video. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, the video was basically, you know, it, the guy did research. I don't know if he had a team or not. Um, funny enough, he's actually... Apparently he's a friend with Chris Fiorello, who's a um, mod on my discord and someone who has been a big friend of the channels, helped me out a lot. 
And uh, so he was like, yeah, I actually know him and all that. Um, but um, I, I found that it was kind of, you know, it was, it, it was very fear mongering, obviously. I mean, the, the, everything was geared toward being fearful, which I thought was just a bad look. A lot of the terminology just showed that there was a lack of overall understanding that it was a very kind of surface level type of research being done. And I mean, obviously I have my bias, each of the guests have their own bias. And then the guy that created the video has his own bias renegade cut, I believe is his name. Um, but it just felt part, it, it felt like it was one, like he was just, you know, okay, that sounds like a good video topic for content, knocked it out and then moved on. Um, didn't seem like it was any sort of truly in-depth look at everything. And also just, you know, just a, a typical lack of understanding of the benefits of the genetic genealogy overall and just, I don't know. He did mention some of the benefits, but it glazed over it greatly. And he also, he conflated a lot of things. Like I remember one of the things that I he didn't seem to mention was that uh, the limitations of which websites could actually access the DNA. He also really, really screwed up the part where he was talking about CODIS and uh, other DNA kits because, you know, we've been talking about these autosomal DNA tests and these are, as I've mentioned a bunch of times, testing 600 to 700,000 SNPs. Well, when we're talking about uh, DNA tests that are used to arrest people and issue warrants and things like that, they aren't these tests. You cannot use autosomal SNP testing to issue a warrant or anything like that. Uh, basically, you can't use genetic genealogy for that. To be able to do that, you have to have further investigation by the law enforcement. And if they're going to use DNA to issue a warrant or prove enough to have a warrant of arrest or whatever, they have to use what's known as an autosomal STR test. So remember, I've been talking about STRs and SNPs, STR being a short tandem repeat. So we're not looking at the SNPs of the autosomal, autosome, which I mean, technically we are, but instead we're looking at the STRs, which is basically, STR is kind of a unique way of looking at SNPs. So before, as I mentioned, short tandem repeat. So, you know, looking at your DNA, maybe you have a sequence ACT, 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 ACT. Well, right there, that's a reading of four short tandem repeats. Basically it repeated four times. And so those specific repeats in specific areas of the DNA allow us to figure out how people are related. And it's autosomal STR tests that have been court approved to issue warrants and things like that. So CODIS is autosomal STRs. And he makes it sound like you could just upload a direct to consumer DNA test to CODIS and you can't. Now, granted you could, you might be able to go through these, the raw data and figure out some of the STRs, but they do very specific testing for that type of thing. So that was a big, big area that he got a lot of that stuff wrong. So yeah, very similar to the Illuminati video. Very similar. Um, all right. We've got a few more. Hello from Finland. Um, 5,000. So is that, is that in reference to the number of SNPs that the V5 chip is testing uh, over the previous uh, test? Um, I, I feel like that might be what you're saying, but I don't know. All right. Uh, let's see. I tested with Ancestry and uploaded on my heritage. I got more false matches with the uploaded version. Okay. Yeah. So interesting. So that that's kind of the, the main thing that I'd be interested in seeing in terms of an uploaded test versus an taking the test through that company is how much of an effect it has on the actual genetic matches. Um, because it's, it can affect matches in two ways. One, it may show you false matches. Basically it shows you that someone's a match, but they truly aren't. Um, or there's a more specific thing where they give you false segments. So even for your true matches, there may be segments that says that you're sharing that you truly don't share but it just thinks you do because of the issues between that. So it's kind of, you can kind of have both at the same time. Um, all right. I need to blow my nose. <laughs> all 
All right, let's uh, let's jump over to doing another question. Um, oh, I don't want to create. Okay, top this month. Okay, so we have these two. So maternal mysteries. All right, we've got kind of a long one. Take a drink before this. Hello, Jarrett. My ancestry DNA readings were completely European, which made enough sense on the surface, but then I uploaded my data from Ancestry to GEDmatch and your DNA portal. I hope this isn't going where I think it's going. There I found traces of North American, Central American, South American, North African, Middle Eastern, and Central Asian on my chromosomes, along with other things which, while interesting, are less relevant to the questions I would like to pose here. Okay, hopefully maybe they're going in a different direction, but yeah. The North American presence is at least partially accounted for in my Treon family search, but everything else serves to sharpen my curiosity about my maternal great-grandfather, whose percentage is almost completely unknown. His name was Lewis Harvey Livingston. According to my records, he was born on February 14th, 1882, probably in New York, and died in Minneapolis, Minnesota, on April 17th, 1920. His official cause of death was Spanish flu, but it was also suspected that if the Spanish flu hadn't killed him, syphilis would have. Oh, he must have lived quite a life. He married a Norwegian uh, woman named Karen Marie Halverson, who was probably one year his junior and died in 1958. With Karen, he had five children. I'm not going to read all their names. Three of these died young, leaving Lillian and Laurel the second. Okay, so... Lillian and Laurel. My tree currently says that Lewis Harvey Livingston's father was Lewis Howard Livingston, born on these dates, but I now think it at least as like, but I now think it at least as likely that his father was either a Pablo Livingston or Lewis Howard Livingston Jr. Okay, so they think that at least as... Okay, <laughs> the wording there is a little odd, or maybe I'm just reading the, uh, maybe my <laughs> emphasis is on the wrong syllable, but uh, yeah, <laughs> either, Paul, so it's equal that it could be any of these three men, um, or, oh, no, two men, Lewis Harvey, yeah, okay, oh, no, three men, so there's a Lewis Howard Livingston, Lewis Howard Livingston Jr., and a Pablo Livingston, okay, as for his mother, the one record I have been able to find suggests that her name was Olive Peterson, but we know that she went by multiple names, including the first name Betsy and surnames Hoffman Stapleton in addition to Livingston. Family legend has it that she possessed considerable wealth or unknown origin, was extremely... Okay. Nothing that's genealogically relevant. Interesting, but not genealogically relevant. That's what we need. If I'm connecting the dots correctly, his paternal family was rascally one rascally one oh was a rascally one to say the least deeply involved in dubious business ventures of which prostitution was one well if he was probably going to die from syphilis not too surprising if his mother was a whore and or madam that might explain the secrecy before i lay out my ultimate questions here i should mention one more thing about the livingston family of which i suspect my great grandpa was a member they married into several Dutch families, such as the Schulers and Beekmans. It is my additional hypothesis that some of these Dutch families whose bloodlines the Livingstons became part of may have been Sephardic. I mean, it's possible. Hence the geographical pattern in my DNA. Oh, gosh. It's, it was starting to go the way away from what I was worried it might be to, and bam, we circled right back. Uh, hence the geographical pattern in my DNA, particularly the North African and Middle Eastern, along with the Iberian Basque, but potentially the others as well. A final note of interest regarding these Dutch families. One of the people in the, this part of my current tree is Stinty Dudis, born 15. Okay, so on to the questions. Do you think I'm on the right track? Do you have any instincts, hunches as to who Lewis Harvey's parents were? Do any of these people sound familiar to you? Well, to answer the, the last question, None of these people sound familiar to me. I've never researched this family. Uh, so yeah, not something that I just know off the top of my head. Um, if I did, I, I'd be quite impressed with myself. <laughs> um, all right. 
do you think I'm on the right track? Unfortunately, I think you're starting to get off track and your biggest issue was as soon as you said this, but then I uploaded my raw DNA ancestry from <laughs> to Jed matching your DNA portal. There I found traces of all of this stuff. And the truth is the Jed match ethnicity calculators don't rely on them. Don't take them and think, oh, these must be better than the than the the main consumer DNA test kits. They aren't. They haven't been updated in years. Uh, some of these probably haven't been updated in maybe almost a decade. Um, they are made by random people on the internet. And you, the, what I like to say when it comes to GEDMAT, and I, I don't really know your DNA portal, but I mean, any of these sites that give the ad, ethnicity admixture breakdowns, as soon as you start getting into this plate, not a good, not a good, yeah. Um, so I think you're getting off path thinking too much about these, um, you know, all of these separate little things, North American, Central American, South American, North African, Middle Eastern, Central Asian. I mean, you, you almost got everything except for East Asian and South and, and Sub-Saharan African, you know? I mean, it's just, it's, I don't know. The way that I like to call these GEDmatch ethnicity admixture calculators is pick your own ancestry because you could go through all of them and get slightly different, you know, or not even slightly different sometimes, but fairly different results, especially for certain calculators that simplify how many regions. Like if you do a Eurogenes K13 through one of the higher ones, basically the number of population groups they're testing. So the K13 is only 13. And then, okay, let's, you know what? Let's pull up the GEDmatch calculator itself. So we can look at all of the many calculators available and then even more see maybe if we can find some of these okay good i just wanted to i really wanted to make sure that i wasn't going to be showing off accidentally um jed match numbers uh kit numbers okay so so here we're on GEDmatch, and we have our admixtures utilities. So we have a lot of stuff going on. First, we have options of how we want it to actually look or the process. But now we have all of our different projects. And each project then has its own things within it. But clicking on this information on the side, we get all of the quick information. So quick description. MDLP, this project has a global focus. And when we click on this, oh, of course, you all don't see that. Um, oh gosh, I know there's a way that I can share it where I don't have to keep switching, but then it unfortunately shows stuff that I don't necessarily want public. So, okay. So we have this here where it goes in depth about the MDLP world 22 calculator and Hey, what's that date? 2012 and more than likely, let's see, we have. Do we have it telling us? Okay, so these are the most recent updates, but on the side, it even gives us these other projects. And so you can see kind of the last, when a lot of these were last uh, uh, edited or talked about or whatever. So you can see a lot of them are very old and basically outdated. Um, ah, I'm going back. We have all of these other ones, so Decade, Eurogenes, which is probably one of the most common ones, Harappa World, Ethio Helix, uh, the Punt DNAL, and Gedrosia uh, DNA. And so each of them has so many options to it. So, all right, actually, I want to be really careful about this part. <laughs> I'm going to continue. I just want to make sure that nothing's popping up. Um, okay, good. So this is the one thing with these live streams. I'm just so worried about accidentally, you know, leaking something. So here in Eurogenes, here's all of these Eurogene options. So you can see K13, K15, K7, K9B, K9, K10, 11, 12, 12B, K36, which I think is the one most people use because it's 36 population groups broken down. Um, and then you have 
your J test, which is the Jewish one, which I know the person who made that, I remember they made a blog article of, like years ago that said, don't rely on this. I haven't updated it in years. It's out of date. It's defunct. I can't believe they're still using it or something like that. But maybe it wasn't that like in depth or whatever, but yeah. So when it comes to these, you could just go through and test each one, each one, each one until you get the one that fits closest to what you want. And that's kind of where the issue is, is you can either do it that way or you could do it the other way, which it sounds like what our OP tester is doing is they're just posting it and doing all these different ones and they're seeing all these results in each one. And it's like, well, what does that mean? Does it mean that there's a connection there? It doesn't. <laughs> it really just is more of an indication of how wide of a variety of, of results you can get from these different calculators. Um, so that's, that's something going back to this question. Actually, you know what? Let me do this. I just realized that it's really, there we go really small. I want, I want you all to be able to read. So, you know, being able to find all these traces of stuff really does not indicate anything. Um, now getting to some of the other questions. Okay. Uh, now, do you think I'm on the right track in terms of that? Yeah, way off. Now, um, in terms of the uh, father of Lewis, he of Lewis, um, you know, we have these three men and I think that you are on the right track in the sense of understanding – well, <laughs> I did not mean to do that – of understanding where the limitations are in your proof. So when it comes to genealogy, we often use what's known as the genealogical proof standard as a set of guidelines to judge the proof of our hypothesis or behind, behind – to, to <laughs> I, I like can't speak right now. That's not good for live streaming. Um, so the genealogical proof standard is a set of guidelines used to judge the uh, merit behind a conclusion and the proof behind that. Basically, how strong is the evidence? And there are five tenets to the genealogical proof standard. And one of them you're adhering to very well here, and that is the possibility of contradictions. Um, and basically here you've identified, well, there's three men who all could have a similar chance of being Lewis Harvey Livingston's biological father. So that's a good thing to do. And you can use that as your research. And it seems like you've probably already researched further down, tracing the family down. But what I would suggest, if you have not, trace the family trees down of these three men. So basically try to find living relatives, descendants of theirs. If you can do living relatives, that works as well. But the main thing here is that you've obviously done a DNA test. So if you can get descendants of these other Livingstons to also DNA test, that might be able to help you determine which line you truly descend from. Now, there may be complications to that, most especially if all of these three Livingston men are related, which... I'm kind of guessing they are, especially Lewis Howard Livingston Jr. I'm guessing he's the son of this Lewis Howard Livingston here. Um, so that one's going to be a lot, that would be a lot harder to determine. You know, when you're looking at these DNA matches to determine who do you descend from, well, if one's father and son, what you need to consider is the difference in how much DNA is shared. Now you are looking at your, what was it, your great-grandfather's? Yeah, maternal great-grandfather. So if you can get your mom to DNA test, this is her grandfather, meaning that she would then share 12 point, about 12.5% 12 DNA with her great-grandfather, who would be one of these three men. And so if that is the true case, that one of these three men is her, her great-grandfather, then if we test their descendants, the descendants should show up at a specific amount because we would expect that based on their distance of relation. So as an example, let's say, let well, I doubt it, but <laughs> let's say this Lewis Howard Livingston Jr. had a son who is still alive. Doubt it, but it could be possible, I guess. <laughs> um, let's say he had a son who's still alive. You did a DNA test. Well, that son would then show up as a great uncle to your mom if, it's tr if this is truly your great great father's father because that's what we would expect and so if you 
if you did find a descendant, then you want to kind of make a chart of, okay, if this is the scenario where Lewis Harvard Livingston Jr. is the father, what are we most likely going to find for the, these descendants? If Lewis Harvard Livingston Sr., assuming that that's the case, was the father, then what would we see? And then if this Pablo Livingston is the father, then what would we see, assuming that they're all from the same family? And so that's something that can help you as you go along, because the, the ultimate goal here to, to prove this is you want to use that DNA. You could, the paper trail may be able to prove it, but it sounds like with all of the complications of everything, you're not really going to be able to get it through the paper trail. So getting these descendants to test, finding living descendants of these men, getting them to test, that's how you're going to be able to do it. And what you can do once they're testing is you can use what are the odds by DNA painter to help you figure that out. Um, so, okay. So let's, <laughs> the, the last question here, do you have any instincts or hunches as to who Lewis Harvey's parents were? I don't, you know, there, nothing's telling me it could go one of, of either way. Um, you know, the only thing that I think that's really interesting to note is just the terms in sense of, you know, he's born 1882 and when we're looking at these three men, this Livingston Sr., you know, he would have been, uh, or he was born in 1814, so that means that he would have been 68, excuse me, when your great-grandfather was uh, born, certainly possible. But these other two men fit a much more common age. They would have been, what, uh, let's see, 38 and 36. So... That would be the only way I'd be leaning is that I'd be leaning maybe a bit towards these two just because the age seems to fit a bit better. But if we're breaking this up in terms of like, you know, out of 100%, what's the the probability that I would place on each one of these men being the father of your great grandfather? I'd probably say 30%, 35%, and 35% really not much difference very negligible and literally the only reason that it's not an even 33.333 percent for each is just because these two men the age fits a little bit better that's really it um so hopefully that answers the question hopefully that was interesting for everybody watching um but let's uh let's mark that reviewed and check on chat so oh wow looks like we've had a lot of chat and i see the numbers really went up wow all right, we've got, oh, we've got a couple of people on Facebook. We have a couple of people on Twitch. Awesome. Uh, yeah, for, for those who are uh, on Twitch, uh, say hello if you can. We'd love to love to see some chats coming through there. Um, okay, let's see. Where was I last? Okay, let's see. How can you tell if you have a false match? That's a really complicated answer, and there's a lot of different ways to tell, and the the possibilities of having a false match go up and down depending on different things the call rate of the dna test uh which doesn't really matter that much with direct to consumer tests uh because it's always about one percent margin of error but the population groups you're coming from so if you come from an endogamous population you have a much higher chance of seeing false matches or false segments um and yeah it's 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 kind of hard to to tell a hundred percent uh you know, it's always kind of a lot of questioning sort of thing. So that might be a good video to do for the future, though. Uh, do you edit your own videos? So I do, but I do have some editors that I work with. I have one editor that I've been working with now for, gosh, almost uh, two years. Uh, I've known him for the longest time. He's been a long-term friend, did a lot of business stuff with him. In fact, when I used to own my own business booking concerts, he was one of the booking agents who worked with me. Uh, and help me do tour management and stuff too. Um, but he does editing for all of my reaction videos, but he does kind of like a basic editing, basically just to save me time. So I send him all the raw footage. He puts the audio together with the, lines it up with the, the, the footage, cleans up the footage a bit, uh, and then cuts everything down and kind of like the base storyline and then sends it to me. And then I go back in and I edit I add in, you know, I add in like the animations and different things like that. Uh, and then I'll cut out a few parts myself too. So yeah. Um, 
Hello, someone unreachable. <laughs> uh, okay, we've got wow, we've got a lot of stuff. So I'm not. I'm going to skip a couple of these questions. I know that they might be uh, good, but uh, let's see. Um, oh wow, forty kits are a lot to manage. Was that how many uh, it showed for me somewhere? Um, I have I, I have so many kits I manage. It's great. I mean, when you're when you work professional genealogy, it just happens. It just happens. So, and all of the kits that I used to manage when I was uh, the lead investigative genetic genealogist at DLI, whew, keeping track of all of that. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh, the Jewish year. Okay. Yeah. So that was, uh, that's five, seven, eight, four. Yeah. I can't believe I didn't recognize that. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Let's see. Oh, we've got Charlie in here. Hello, Charlie, one of our wonderful admins. Um, okay, let's see. Ba, 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 ba. Um, oh, <laughs> the question from my mom. <laughs> Is it possible to get DNA to test from old licked envelopes and such after people pass away? Yes, it is. It is possible to do that. You can, there's companies that do it, but the issue with those is that there's uh, there's a very low margin of success from what I understand. Um, new technology is being developed that will hopefully eventually make its way to the direct-to-consumer market and make these types of things more uh, possible. But there's a company called uh, By the Letter DNA and then Keepsake DNA. And those two companies are the main ones that do that. So, all right, let's, uh, all right, we have that clicked as reviewed. Um, okay, so since all of the rest are just three, I'm going to I'm going to go into here. And uh yeah, I'm going to go by the new and get get some of some some of these older ones, some of these ones that are from almost 2 years ago or something. So uh yeah. Just taking a while to load. There we go. We're slowly starting to get into it. I might need to. I might need to look at some memes too. Jeez, it is. It's crazy how far down here it really it really gets. Jeez, it's not going to be long before I start hitting the three year. Okay, yeah, I think I think there were some of these that I started. I was purposely kind of skipping because it was just it's just the admixture question just in a different way. Um, oh, I do need to. All right, sorry, I need to check something with my Twitch while I. While I do this, um, while I'm doing this, I should mention, I know that I kind of skipped a lot of questions. I, I mentioned this uh, at the beginning of the stream. I will try to get to questions posted in chat. I cannot guarantee it. But um, if you do post a question through YouTube using the super sticker uh, chat or whatever it's called, um, I, I will guarantee that I'll, I'll, I'll answer those. Plus that helps me out that, you know, supports the channel. Um, but certain, I'm just, I just need to do something real quick for, um, okay. Okay. Good. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. Um, all right. So getting to the questions, I guess, update, update question about all right, let's look at this one because this is a question for review. If it's an admixture one, ah, it's just an admixture one. I'm from Argentina, Buenos Aires. I'm a bit confused for my results. Dad's side, Spanish, Argentinian. My dad, blonde eye, blue hair. Mom's side, northern Italy, southern France, northern Spain. Don't know much. Austria. My question is, where could the America's DNA come from? It doesn't match my research and family history. Uh, also a bit confused about the Slavic Ashkenaz results since I never heard anyone from my family had that heritage. Uh, okay, we'll take a quick look at this. Um, so, okay, you know what? 
I think this will be. Ugh. Did it seriously just do that? Okay, good. Okay, there we go. I was like, what is it doing? So hopefully you all can read this well enough. So 85% European, less than 1% Ashkenazi Jewish, which I say this all the time. Anyone with Iberian ancestry, you're going to, it's not going to be uncommon to see 2% or less Ashkenazi Jewish or even possibly more because that's basically representing the Sephardic ancestry that you have that all almost all Iberians have due to the Inquisitions. Um, then the Americas, 14%, um, and a, a wide range, Central American, Andes Caribbean, Central and South uh, Mexico, Argentina and Chile. So we're getting, you know, all kind of over that area. And from what this person was saying, I mean, it doesn't sound that out of possibilities when paternal grandparents born in Argentina uh, maternal grandparents emigrated straight from Spain. So that makes sense that, you know, th that side probably not getting in from there, but paternal grandparents born in Argentina, that's not surprising. And if they were first cousins and they both had native ancestry, Amerindian ancestry, I mean, that certainly makes sense. I mean, 14% is the equivalent of a great grandparent of full indigenous ancestry. But it's also the equivalent of two ancestor or, uh, of two second great grandparents with indigenous ancestry and four third great grandparents. And you know, it's not always going to come from the same line. And if these two were cousins and they both had that native ancestry, it certainly makes sense. For the mom's side, paternal grandparents came from these areas, but how 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 far back? And then maternal grandparents, we don't know much, um, but was apparently, yeah. So, so I mean, it, I'm not, where you live, where you're coming from, what you do know of your ancestry, I don't think any of this is surprising. Don't think any of it's surprising. Um, oh, and we even have people basically down here probably saying the, the kind of the exact same thing. Um, all right, so we're just going to, we're going to mark this as, <laughs> as reviewed and then now i have to go back all the way back down this is one of the things i kind of don't like about the the new reddit layout i like the old reddit layout better um so blah 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 all right well while that's kind of getting going, let's see. Oh, we did get a super chat. Thank you so much, Alexandra. What software do you recommend to build a tree? Now, I guess the, there's a few answers to this question, and it depends a bit on preferences. My, well, I guess it depends on preferences and use of the tree. My personal preference is actually to use softwares for different parts of the tree process i guess you could say so your question is specifically do you to build a tree so in, in when i hear build a tree to me that means actively researching and building that tree and doing that and my preference is using ancestry dna because it's the best way to focus on your work expand things out have quick access to hints easy access to kind of get into your searches and then you can always do much further research and all that but ancestry kind of is a good place to keep track of your own thing um now i do also really love genie but for years i said that it was my main place that i kept my main tree and then in recent years i've kind of changed my my mindset on that to ancestry just because with genie you do really have that issue of Someone can go in there and screw something up. And I actually, I, I just had a cousin message me yesterday saying that this one line of ours that we had spent a lot of time tr working on and tracing back to the 18th century. And he'd even paid, paid researchers to help us out. Um, someone had gone in and really screwed it up. And now I've got to go find some time at some point to go in and 
fix a lot of it. So that is one big issue with Genie, but Genie does have that collaborative element. And so my workflow often is, is my main tree and focus of work is on ancestry. And then once I've built it out on ancestry, then I transfer it over to Genie. And the reason for that is for that collaborative work, because there is a lot of stuff on Genie that won't be on Ancestry. And even more, when you put things on Genie, people may be able to go in and help you expand upon it. Granted, there is that downside on the other part of it where they could go in and screw it up. But in my experience, more often people are helpful than screwing things up. Granted, when someone screws something up, they can really screw things up. Um, so my workflow is often that, building on Ancestry, getting it onto uh, Genie from there. Um, now, in terms of preferences, though, there are some people that do not like to do their tree building online. They prefer using offline software. And there's two main companies that I know about and have used for offline software. Granted, I haven't done it extensively because in my own personal opinion, I don't really see that much of a benefit in doing offline software. Um, but Family Tree Maker and Roots Magic are kind of the two big ones that I find most people enjoy. There are a lot of other ones out there. So hopefully that answers, uh, hopefully that, answers that question. Um, but one thing I should say with this is I actually try to keep a tree, at least a basic tree, on almost every single website out there. And that has to do with the concept known as cousin bait. Basically, the more trees and information you have out there on your family, the easier it is for your cousins to find you. Because if you have a cousin that's looking into the, your, your shared ancestry and they find the work that you've done, it's very likely they're going to contact you. I mean, think about every time you've worked on your own ancestry and found someone who's already been working on it, most especially a cousin. So, all right, let's just kind of um, look at some of the other stuff. You're very welcome, Alexandra. Thank you again so much for uh, the support and the super, super chat. Um, okay, so let's get back to these questions. All right, the French ancestry, French ancestry, uh, using my tree and general history knowledge to understand my admixture results. It's Well, Govier is someone that's been on, it's been very helpful on the channel. Uh, this isn't even a question, but this is probably a good one because I was about to say that I think they would know. After seeing the questions people have here, I thought I would point out how I can use a mixture of my tree, DNA matches, and general history knowledge to make sense of my admixture results. And I'm not going to go into this, but I, I imagine that this will be pretty good. Um, Govir is someone that has been very helpful in answering things for people in my reddit and i know i've seen them post a lot of stuff elsewhere so yeah definitely if you'd like to see what they have to say um okay uh dna review it's just gonna be another comparison isn't it i hate to skip over people but answering the same admixture question over and over and over just becomes kind of yeah yeah it's kind of just <laughs> kind of just same thing. All right, I'm sorry. I'm going to skip that one. <laughs> so I just I just really want to get... I mean, it, I think at this point, we've all seen these questions. In fact, I think that was one of the things I saw in my survey uh, was loving the live streams, but can you just skip the admixture questions? Sick of seeing them. All right. Oh, wait. I think that I answered this one. Either way, this is way too much information to try to go to right now. But I know I've seen Y Barenth before, and I'm pretty sure I answered their question. So, um, all right, let's see if we can find. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe I need to try to find something. Uh, all right, let's see. Let's see what this one. Okay, adopted great-grandfather, was he hiding something? Hello, my name is Carlene. I'm Italian on my mom's side, Jewish on my dad's side, basically a 50-50 split, even in 23andMe. The only odd percentage is 2% Egypt Arab. I've hit a wall with trying to build my family tree because it seems that my great-grandfather made up his last name when he immigrated. The great-grandfather I'm trying to research is named Silvio Tanas. 
His brothers and sisters all have the last name Cuccio Cuccio. There are rumors in the family that he was adopted. Some say he was adopted from Turkey or Cyprus, or he was in the mafia. You get the gist. I don't know the name of my second great grandfather to confirm the last name Cuccio either. I would love to link my genie tree for you, but unfortunately it doesn't display extended family to people I share to. Well, actually I'm a genie curator, so I can see everything. Granted, I wouldn't show it on this uh, stream. Currently the only results for all of my family members and my heritage is from my genie tree, which I find to be very rude whenever I search. Yeah, it's kind of funny when you build out a big tree, put all this stuff up, and then it starts giving you hints of, hey, we got a new hint, and you look at it and it's like, that's something I put up online years ago. Um, so yeah, when Sir, so um, I think this is Gabrielle, uh, Gabriella, who's uh, been on the stream a lot. Oh, why won't it? Something's going on. Hold on one second. Hopefully, we're not glitching out here. Okay, I don't know what was going on there. Okay, when searching. On your DNA relatives, do you find any similar surname to Cuccio, Cuccia, Tanas? If not, any... <laughs> I guess I'm just not going to highlight it. If not, any of the descendants of your great-grandfather can test in 23andMe to confirm the rumor. That's a great way to go about it. On Family Tree DNA, you can find for free his naturalization record, though on the one I found does not mention any family members. There's also a passenger manifest with his name, Mention his father as Babasto, Batasto, or Carmine, and a cousin, Giovanni Lunin, Sunin. All this information still needs to be confirmed if it's the same person. Um, thank you for looking. Carmine sounds familiar. We found a letter from his brother from a prisoner of war camp in England from World War I addressed to Carmine. I've never heard or seen those other names before. You said it was on Family Tree DNA. Uh, well, now this person is talking about the naturalization record. Um, which they say on family tree, I think what they meant to say is on family search. So let's pull that up. So here we have family search and we're gonna do a search over here and we're gonna be looking for Silvio Tanas. And when he was born 1896. So I always like to do two year gap just to start. And we're not going to worry about where he was born, even though we know he was born in Italy. Let's just see what that turns up. Okay, so we're looking June 6th. This birth shows June 20th. He did die January 4th, 1979 in Florida. So this is Silvio. So we've got a lot of social security stuff. We have a World War II draft record. And then do we see naturalization? Here we have the uh, manifest record. Let's see, where's Silvio? Here we go. So Silvio Tanas, number 28. So let's see, 10 years old. And then, let's see, this is... Father Karma. Now, this is interesting. We This is one of the issues with uh, some of these uh, lists is they aren't very good at keeping, <laughs> keeping the line right. So the person said that um, Father as Babasta, Batista, or Carmine. And the reason for that is because here... This is the spot of who's the closest relative back in your home country. So going, the name and complete address of nearest relative or friend in country where alien came from. Oh, something in my eye. And so down here, what they're saying is, we see Father Carmine, Father Baptista, and you can't quite tell, because it's this line here, 
is it Father Carmine or Father Batista? Now, I think it's probably Carmine because we see one, two, three, one, two, you know, it ends at the third, so it's probably that. Um, but then we get where are they coming from or where, where that person lives, so likely where that person is from. And then when we go to the next page, remembering line 28, we get more information. Um, so just going through the top just to show what it is whether in possession of $50 and if less, how much, whether ever before in the U S and if so, when and where, whether going to a relative and friend where, and then a lot of other stuff. And so going back down to 28, we see that he's got $25 on him. Never been in the United States visiting cousin Giovanni Sunin or Lunin, which is what they mentioned. And then they have all of this other information and where they came from in Italy. So this is giving a whole lot of stuff. And let's jump back to the question page. So with this information from what they said, I've never seen or heard those names before. Well, now we have a whole lot of new information that they didn't have before that they can look into. For one, they have the family names. They have this, you know, Baptista, Batasta, or Carmine. I think it's probably going to Carmine. But most specifically, they have Giovanni Lunin. Um, even better, uh, with Giovanni Lunin, it gives... I mean, you see the street name, but it's actually kind of, unfortunately, with this one, it's faded out pretty badly. So right here, we've got Giovanni Lunin, but we can see 150 Street something, something, something. And then it looks like maybe, <clears throat> maybe New York, possibly Newark, um, because that, you know, that looks like it's New Jersey. Um, although here, New York, so it's probably New York, because right here, it's definitely New York. So um, I guess, is there a Prince? Yeah, I don't know. Unless maybe that's not New York and I, it's something else and I'm just reading it wrong. But I'm guessing it's probably New York. So, so we're getting a lot of information here. A lot of information that can then be researched further and pulling up this Giovanni Lunin might be able to be the thing that pulls up the information we need. Now, the manifest is from 1913. And one of the common techniques when you find a manifest is, we'll look at the next census record to see if they're still living at the address. My guess is, is that by that time, by 1930, seven years later, he probably wasn't living with his cousin anymore. He was probably on his feet at that point. Uh, not always necessarily the case. And even if it, you know, even if he wasn't necessarily up on his, feet, his own feet necessarily at that point, he might've been living with another relative. Um, so going back again, back, back. So there's a lot that they can do. But on top of that, what they mentioned about finding these DNA relatives that have the same names, also getting these cousins that are descending from the same great grandfather, the big thing with the, having those cousins test the other descendants of your great grandfather is then you can do triangulation between them to see what matches are you all sharing? Because presumably all the matches that you share with those others from your great grandfather, that's going to be your great grandfather's ancestry, or it's going to be, those are going to be cousins through that ancestry and that's building those trees out can help you. Um, so Hopefully that was uh, hopefully that was quite helpful for you um, in terms of the percentages and stuff. You know, it could be indicative of something, but I wouldn't read too much into it. And honestly, the way you kind of just mention it very quickly and then just keep going. That's the way I treat it. Just, you know, OK, back of my mind, something to consider. And then as we go forward, you know, two percent Egyptian Arabic, that's going to be pretty far back. So that's going to be something where, okay, now we found my great grandfather's family. And hey, I just saw that his grandfather came from Egypt. Well, that makes sense because we have that 2% and it matches up with a third great grandfather, possibly being Egyptian or something, you know. But it could also just be a misread or something. So, all right. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, let's click review. Let's see. 
Oh my gosh, I didn't even realize I've been going for an hour and over an hour and a half at this point. <laughs> wow, I've not been keeping track of the time. Okay, let's go back. Uh, let's check. Um, close this out and let me check chat. See see if I missed anything. Um, read awesome. Yeah, my heritage has applied a limit to how many DNA matches you convert view per day. I they had that for a while, but I thought they took that down. Um, that was in response to that whole twenty three and Me uh, issue that happened with the you know the the hack, which wasn't really a hack. I forgot exactly what it's called, but it basically they got a bunch of usernames and passwords from another site that was hacked, and then they used those usernames and passwords to get into people's profiles that had used the same username and passwords on that other website and that's my that's my understanding of what happened uh let's see uh they started this after the data leak of 23andme we also cannot download this segment data anymore now is this is now i'm pretty sure this is still the case on 23andme but is it still the case on my heritage because i thought that they went back on that um, unless maybe they did it again, uh, but I don't know. Maybe maybe I just haven't been keeping enough close of an eye on it, but I've been trying to. Um, okay, a lot of talks more about that. Okay, all right. Well, I guess let's uh, jump to the next question and just check stats elsewhere. All right, we've got a few people Twitch, a few people Facebook, most everybody YouTube as usual. Makes sense. I'm, I'm a YouTuber. What can I say? Ooh. Oh, you know what I just noticed? I was like, why is it so quiet? Don't want it too loud. Just enough. Give give a little uh, a little bit of ambiance. All right. Next question. Hopefully, let's hope we get a good one. Because it's really at this point now, it's like it's kind of like trying to jump through the minefield of <laughs> admixture questions. All right. Question on probable Jewish ancestry. Ah, another admixture question. All right. Let's see. Hello, everyone from Uruguay. I'm not going to be surprised to see they get anything like that. Extensive documented tree, Spanish Portuguese ancestries, okay, idea of Native American. That said, there are a few mysteries not that far back. No, there are things that we know. My mother has an unknown great grandfather, the family. See, I always find it kind of funny. We have a pretty extensive and documented tree, but I have a whole great grandparent that I don't know anything about. To me, those two statements are kind of contradictory. I would say we have a pretty extensive and documented tree, or a pretty extensive and documented or with part of the tree being pretty extensive and documented um you know yeah because because for me i think extensive and documented tree i'm thinking you know that's going to be going back third fourth great grandparents and you know almost every single one anyway my mother has unknown great grandfather family stories say could be sailor from scandinavia take that with a grain of salt my mom and I uploaded a MyHeritage and Family Tree today, and we were surprised to see some Jewish ancestry there. In MyHeritage, I got 3.2, while my mom, 4.7. In FTDNA, I got none, but my mother has less than 1%. Is that a common occurrence? Also, both of us have several 100% Ashkenazi Jew matches on FTDNA. We probably descend from Sephardic Jews from Iberia and the Azores Islands, and since endogamy was pretty much the norm in our region, we might have received some old Sephardic DNA, although I'm aware they came here around 1760. I know it could all be just traces, but I'd really like to know what your expert opinion on this. Do you think that's just misreading old DNA or could it be something else? Now, I think the most important thing that they said here is this. Both of us have several 100% Ashkenazi Jewish matches on family tree DNA. Um, out of everything they get, the fact first off, the fact they're from Uruguay and have an extensive Spanish and Portuguese ancestry, they indicate we probably descend from Sephardic Jews from Iberia and the Azores Islands. 
Um, it's just common, as we mentioned before. Anyone with Iberian ancestry, you're likely going to have Jewish ancestry in there. So a couple of percentages isn't that uncommon. But interestingly enough, they both did get significant amounts. Granted, it's my heritage, which a lot of people, probably the company more than any that I know, that people say, I think they get my admixture wrong. But they're getting 3.2 and 4.7, daughter and mother respectively. Family tree DNA, nothing. But the mom is getting some of that Yemenite Jewish on family tree DNA. Um, and then we both have less than 1% from Southern Levant on FTDNA. Um, so the admixture is kind of, you know, there's something there. But there is kind of a little wishy-washiness to it. But... Like I said, that 100% Ashkenazi Jewish matches, that's the important part. Because having that indicates technically one of three main things. One, these Ashkenazi Jewish matches are just false positive matches that are just showing up because of something happening with the DNA test. Whether it be part of that margin of error, the 1% margin of error, um, whether it be just the difficulty of deciphering dna although you have your mom tested so hopefully yours is phased uh but uh assuming that it's unfazed dna which i think my heritage does automatic phasing but i could be wrong maybe that's 23 and me um but once you do phasing that could change things because um when they're reading the dna and going through it you have your dna from your mom and your dna from your dad but they can't tell which is from which and so sometimes what happens is those different markers are using those SNP markers. They're looking for sequences to create a segment. And sometimes they might see some, uh, some SNPs from your mom, some SNPs from your dad, and they're kind of in the similar areas, but they don't know which from your mom, which from your dad. So then they go, oh, well, that creates a sequence and they think it's from the same parent. And then all of a sudden you have a false positive a segment just because it didn't know that, well, this part is actually from mom, this part's from dad, and it just looks like a segment because that's the state of the DNA. Um, so that's, that's <laughs> if you've ever heard IBS, identical by state, that's what that means. Um, so basically, when you phase your DNA, then the system goes, oh, wait, this is from mom, this is from dad, that's not a segment, and they take it apart, and then they're able to figure out what it is exactly. So that's how you can sometimes get some false matches. Um, but looking through the results, I mean, you kind of already said it, you know, yeah, Ashkenazi, yeah. So, uh, well, I guess let me let me see what what else do they have? Yeah, nothing, nothing else really too too crazy uh, different. Um, so yeah, so what can you do? F uh, or yeah, do you think this? <laughs> Sorry. Do you think this could be just misreading old DNA or could there be something else there? All right. So the first thing I said could be one of three things. The first thing was that it's just a false match uh, to these Ashkenazi Jewish matches. The second thing is that it is as what you're kind of hypothesizing in that this indicates that you have Jewish ancestry because if they're 100% Ashkenazi Jewish, that means almost all of their ancestry was Jewish and thus you likely descend from shared common Jewish ancestry. The third option is that these Ashkenazi Jewish matches of yours, even though they're getting 100% or close to 100%, they may still have non-Jewish ancestry because, you know, when it comes to your DNA, recombination makes it so that once you get so far back with your ancestors, you're going to start finding more and more that they are truly your ancestor but you inherited no DNA from them because it was filtered out after so many generations of recombination. And so what, what I'm basically saying is that they may have uh, all Ash almost all Ashkenazi ancestry, but then they have some sort of a European ancestor in there that just happens to also be one of your ancestors, and that's why you're connecting. So three main things is you could be matching because it's false, you could be matching because you both have shared Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, or not even Ashkenazi, but just Jewish ancestry. And the third is because you all have shared European ancestry. Um, so the, the way that I would go about it is 
you have these 100% Ashkenazi Jewish matches. You only mentioned being on my heritage and family tree DNA. So I'd highly recommend upload a Jed match, upload to genie.com, upload to living DNA and see what matches you get there as well. Don't worry too much about the ad mixtures. I mean, you can take a look at them, see, am I getting any sort of Jewish percentage that might be indicating, yeah, I am on the right path because the more tests that give you that percentage, the higher your confidence can be, but it's not going to put your confidence that much higher. I mean, we're talking about maybe, uh, you know, add, add like a half a percentage point of confidence when you get another admixture test saying, yeah, we're seeing some Jewish ancestry there too. But what you want to do is basically get as many Ashkenazi Jewish, these Ashkenazi Jewish matches, these, I wouldn't, I, I'd say over 75%, um, where it's basically the high majority of their family is going to be Ashkenazi Jewish get a whole bunch of them and start to see if you can find a commonality of family between them. Basically, can you find that, you know, certain DNA matches of yours are all coming from the same shared ancestry? Uh, if that's the case, then you're able to then build their family tree, find out how they're connected. So maybe, maybe you find some of these 100% Ashkenazi Jewish matches, and then you look into it and you find out, oh, well, actually three of them are a set of first cousins. They're all first cousins to each other. And they all share these grandparents, but they all have different parents. So then you know that, okay, whatever that grandparents family is, that's the side of their family that you're going to be related to them through. And on your side of the family, assuming you have matches beyond just your mom, look at and see what shared matches that you know from your family that they're matching with. So you say here the mother is an unknown great or my mother has an unknown great grandfather so you have an unknown second great grandfather well then get a bunch of your uh cousins from that second great grandfather to test and then if they're also matching these ashkenazi jewish matches in similar amounts then you have much more confidence that not only are you on the right path but it also seems to be from this unknown great grand your unknown second great grandfather your mom's unknown great grandfather and so then you can take it from there so there is a way you can go about it now granted if it is quite distant then that's going to mean that um you know you are dealing with the possibility of it being difficult to find matches that are connected to each other i guess you could say but looking at my heritage results just to give another view of things you have 3.2%, your mom has 4.7%. And just looking at the recombination levels, and let, let me throw this banner up here because I know I still have this banner. These are the percentages we're looking at. We have 25%, 12.5, 6.25, 3.125, and so on as we go back. And so with this person uh, having their mom at 4.7, because you always want to look at the older generation to get the better idea because recombination can be weird. So with mom at 4.7, well, that's going to be right between second and third great grandparents. So that means that if this is true, that this is coming from, let's, let's, let's be more specific. So saying that this is true and coming from one ancestor of your mom, we'd be looking at most likely a second or third great grandparent to your mom. And well, we're looking at this being a mystery of an unknown great grandfather. Well, then that would mean that this could possibly be that unknown great grandfather's father or mom. And maybe that's also why it's unknown because it's not uncommon where if back in those times, someone who was Jewish and not Jewish had a baby together, they weren't going to be together. That baby wasn't going to know. And in fact, in my own family, this has been a very common, this has probably been one of the most common NPE solves that I've done, which has happened on many branches of my family where I had a Jewish cousin, often a Jewish male cousin, who impregnated a Catholic woman. And then that child had, then grew up not knowing their, their father because they weren't told who the father was, whether the, the mom knew or not. And this, let's see how, I mean, it's, at least five times in my family that I can think of that happening. Interestingly enough, 
two coming from one branch and then three coming from another branch. So it's actually kind of the same branches all in Philadelphia, funny enough, but it basically, well, actually, no, that's, that's wrong. Not Philadelphia, somewhere from Boston. Um, but that's just a common thing that happens. And that might be the case here of why something weird's going on, if that's true. So I think that, you know, you are on the right path. I'm glad I answered this question because, I, you know, with these admixture questions, it's always kind of the same thing. But this kind of is, this is getting into how to use the admixture for actual genealogy. And this is where the admixture is useful. But this is just, it's just a very small part of it. It's just a hint. Um, you know, this is just a, a guidance to our research. And hopefully that research will take this, you know, very vague painting that's been painted by this admixture and make it a much clearer one. Um, so yeah. Okay. I think let's, uh, let's tag this and let's check, check chat, uh, reviewed apply. And do we have anything from chat? I don't even know where I last checked. Okay. Yeah. I think I saw that. Here we go. All right. A lot of comments, a lot of chat in between everybody. Um, all right. I do feel I see a number of, you know what? Oh, gosh. I just realized. <laughs> there we go. I just realized that I've, I've had it where I've just been like off to the side. Okay, I think that's going to look a lot better. All right. I do feel like I see a number of 100% Ashkenazi Jewish relatives on my heritage than I would expect, usually as low confidence matches. I wish I could figure out if it's IBS or actual proper matches. Yeah, I, I mean, I, that that is, uh, that is not something that I have personally seen. But then again, I've also, you know, a lot of the kits I run are mostly Jewish, but I do run a lot of non-Jewish kits on my heritage. And, um, I don't know that, 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 that is definitely something that might bring a lower confidence to you in terms of having a lot of 100% Ashkenazi mat Jewish matches is it, you know, it certainly brings up the confidence that that percentages might be true, but then if, you know, there is a low confidence with these matches, then that's not going to bring the confidence up as much. Um, Oh, and then continuing, Dre says, we have some Southern European, and I've had some trace Ashkenazi. I've had some trace Ashkenazi Jewish, and my mom has some trace Coptic Egyptian, so I feel like Sephardic ancestry is possible, but hard to determine. Yeah, I mean, in my experience with the Sephardic ancestry, it, it comes out as a hodgepodge of a lot of the different things that always seem to make sense. It always seems to come out as a hodgepodge of, like, Mediterranean, North African, Middle Eastern, and then sometimes you might get a little bit of uh, other Asian or something thrown in there. Uh, but it's it's not necessarily proof of it. It's just, you know, I, I've, I see a lot of people without Sephardic Jewish ancestry with readings like that. And then I see a lot of people with Sephardic Jewish readings that have that too. So it, it, it's not something that you can point at and be like, yes, that means that I have Sephardic Jewish ancestry. Um, because it could be something else, but if you do have Sephardic Jewish ancestry that you're expecting and you don't get it, but you get percentages similar to it in those readings, that certainly makes sense. So it's, yeah. Okay. Um, hi Jared. I posted recently about Finnish ancestry on my mom's side, but I didn't add the review sticker. So you might not have seen it. Oh yeah. I mean, if I get, you know, if I get to it, I'll get to it. I, I'm not worried about the stickers. I try to put those on when I can, if I see people haven't, I haven't done that in a while. And then for a while, my mods and admins were helping me with that too, but I don't know if they are either, but yeah, I mean, just to say it again, um, you know, with this stream, <laughs> I actually am going to go for a little bit longer. I know I've been going for almost two hours, but I don't know. I'm just feeling like it's flowing. Uh, but with this stream, I, I try to answer, uh, you know, questions through chat. I don't guarantee it, but if you do a super sticker chat or whatever it's called through YouTube, I do guarantee I will answer those. Um, 
and then in terms of the stuff through reddit it's gonna it, it's it's gonna vary um you know the way that i'm doing it the way we start out is we go through the top ones from the past month uh which we've already done today so we did these top three ones and then i think once we kind of get past the top three then we can go uh pat you know jump to the the new ones then basically what we we're just looking at um so you know if you posted recently no you know it might be a while before before i get to it unfortunately um so all right let's get back down here and answer more questions it's kind of funny i've noticed that the numbers have been going up and up and up much uh as, as i've been going longer so that's that's good um this is oh wait yeah that was one that i said i wasn't going to because it's too much um, and since we've been going a while for that let's wake everyone up Okay, that's that's better. Hopefully, if the music's too loud, let me know. Just comment and chat. Um, all right, so DNA results, DNA, DNA, DNA review. Um, okay, I think that's the one that we just was that the one we just did? No, this was the one we just did. Um, so that's <laughs> so what see, I always find it funny question for review, and then it's just gonna be DNA results, and if it's just DNA results. It's just DNA results, basically. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Then it's just kind of. Yeah. That one's too much. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Let's uh, let's go. Help with pointier line. Help with pointier line. I am at my wit's end. I've been trying to find out who the father of my third great grandfather David R. Pointier is. He's born this date in this place in or around here. He served in 1812. He married Polly names, children names. They did this. They did that. My grandmother told me the family originally from France. I've not been able to prove or disprove that. One issue I'm running into is the name of myriad of variations of the name. According to two county histories, the Pointers are a French descent. I believe there may be two different families. One of French and one of English descent. I believe that the Poignier's anglicize their name. Um, I don't know this for sure, but this I'm confused and frustrated. I've not been able to find any documents that definitively link David R. Poignier with anyone but his children and grandchildren. When I look at other family trees, his, I find no corroborating evidence to support the lines. Um, okay, well, I mean... <laughs> The, the suggestion that I, I'd give here, because this is basically, I mean, this is basically, here's the full genealogy we have. What can you do? Uh, I mean, and there's, you know, there's a lot. Uh, what do people say down here? Yeah, DNA testing. So had, they said they hadn't done DNA testing. Uh, my daughter does. Oh, they did do a DNA. Oh, they don't show French. It doesn't matter about showing French. Yeah, it's true. Not. Um, you know, with the French, whatever, as long as you get Northwestern European, it could be your French ancestry. Just because you don't get French readings doesn't mean your ancestors didn't live in France. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the main thing here, I think, would just be saying, you know, just learn, just learn more and more about what record sets are available in this area. Um, they said something that made it sound like, uh, yeah, I mean, this is someone born in the 18th century, too. So this is, you know, kind of getting into the harder part of things. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is just, it's a matter of just trying to learn, find more and more records available for this area uh, to see, can you find anything that may give you a new hint um, something that I think a lot of people that will kind of not look into because they're very difficult to find sometimes and can be very difficult to go through uh, are notarial records. 
Um, so you'd have to find out if, if any of those are available, basically, you know, records from the notary. And um, beyond that, doing the DNA testing and matches, that could help you as well. You know, you're looking at this point in your family and you have this question, you know, were there two families or not? And that could easily be solved by doing a Y DNA study. Basically, get a male point year from your side and a male point year from this English side you think might be there, and have them do a Y DNA test. And if they come back and match, you know that it's the same family. If not, you don't know. Or not, you don't know. But if they don't match, then you know they are different families. As well, that could be helpful for determining is it French ancestry? Is it something else? Um, most especially if you're able to do like a whole genome sequence or the big Y, so you can do the really extensive wide stuff, not just getting a haplo group, but also getting matches and even more being placed within the phylogenetic tree. So basically the big family tree of haplo groups and being put further, further down the stream. So hopefully, hopefully that helps. Um, unfortunately with this one, it's kind of a matter of just doing like a lot of genealogy research. And to do that, especially with something that seems to be have seems to have been so researched so in depth, you know, I'd have to. If this person hired me to work on this, this would be the type of thing where I'd tell them, okay, before we get to work, you need to send me everything you have. Um, you know, try to make it as as easily understandable as possible, because when you hire a researcher to do stuff. They need to spend time reviewing it, and that—that's part of their time. They're going to charge you for that because they, you know they need to learn what's going on and figure it out, see what you've gone over, and then once they do that, then they get into the research. And so, you know, you need to be very succinct in what you send them, uh, but you also need to make sure that you include as much as possible. Um, because, like, let's say you think, you know, what I don't need to worry about sending them all these records that I found. And then you send them all the information and then they're going to come back to you and give you a report, give you a lot of documents that you may have already found because they didn't know you already found them because you didn't send it to them. Um, so yeah, just a, I guess a good, a good point of information for uh, people thinking about considering hiring professional genealogists or something. Um, Cause that, that might also be a way to go about this is you know, it's such in-depth information. You do have a lot of little details of things and finding a special uh, a genealogist expertise, um, someone who has that expertise in these areas to have them dive deeper, that, that would be the way to go. So hopefully, hopefully that answers that question. Let's see. Uh, uh, let's see what's going on with chat. Oh, not too much. Um, yeah, it's just all the same people logging in on multiple devices. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, for, for those who don't know, I, I said it a couple of times, but I'm streaming on three platforms right now. I'm streaming through YouTube, which most of you are watching from, but I'm also streaming on Facebook and Twitch. Uh, but for anyone who does have an account on Twitch, uh, or, and or Facebook, but most especially Twitch, I'm really trying to build up my presence there. Just kind of have, have something other than YouTube in case, you know, you never know if something's going to happen to YouTube. Uh, but just build up something there. So if you are on Twitch uh, or Facebook, go over, uh, find the stream there, like, follow, subscribe, do what you know, do whatever. To it super it helps me out a lot. And most especially if you're on Twitch, if you can comment, that'd be awesome. All right, let's continue with the uh, the questions. Um, I know I looked at this meme already, but we'll break break things up with a meme right now. It's a depressing thing knowing you can never be sure of anything you discover and it will never be completed. Yeah. <laughs> happy, happy, happy. Starts researching family tree. Completely different person. <laughs> yeah. This person going to bed on time, just having fun, all that. This person canceling plans, staying up till 3 a.m. because they found a record that all of a sudden it helped them, you know, make a huge breakthrough and spent hours and hours building and building that tree. <laughs> That's great. All right. Um, all right. Meme review. Thank you. Which one's that? Oh, yeah. From our illustrious Matt. All 
Okay. Um, who is Sarah Jean? Who is she? Ah, just followed on Twitch. Thank you very much, Cal Rock, for the follow. Um, you'll have to let me know. I have on Twitch. I have the alerts set up to pop up to say when someone follows. Let me know if that actually came up. <laughs> I don't know how well I actually have all that stuff. So now it's Callum. Thank you, Callum. Thank you very much. All right. Who is Sarah Jane? I need help finding my great grandmother. My mother always told me my middle name, Ross, great name, by the way, was a family name. My sister, or her sister, my aunt, told me it was their grandmother's maiden name. However, my mom told me her maiden name was Carlisle. Sarah Jane's son, my grandfather, said she was born in Londonderry, Ireland. She died in New York City. My grandfather's sister said she's English. I can't find evidence of her existence before a 1910 U.S. census, which says she was born in Scotland. The family story is that Sarah Jane married... Chapstick. There we go. Getting dry out here in North Cackalack. Okay, the family story is Sarah Jane married a John Smith... Uh, born in Easton and uh, wherever England, died at sea, 1886, and had three kids with them, John and my great-grandfather, James Mather Gillies, then served together in Queen Victoria's Guard in India. Okay, James had promised to take care of Sarah Jane after John died. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was like, I was confused here. Okay. So the family story is Sarah Jane married a John Smith and they had three kids. So John and your great grandfather are not some of the three kids. That, that, the way that was worded, that's what I thought they were saying. So okay. John and, his, and, and the poster's great grandfather, James Mathers Gillies, served together in Queen Victoria's Garden, India. James promised to take care of Sarah Jane after John died. Okay, so John Smith. That would have been great to add <laughs> that last name in. Okay. Um, their first child... Okay, so, so James... Okay, so she married James then and had a kid with him? Is that... I think that's what they're saying. I think that's what they're saying. <laughs> Unfortunately, this was worded really very vague. One thing I should say for everyone, when, you're, when it comes to writing about genealogy, be as specific as possible. Constantly use first, middle, and last name if you can. Keep up with it because then you get things like this. They had three kids. Sean and my great-grandfather. <laughs> Which, I mean, you know, granted, three kids and it only lists two people, but still, I, you know. All right. Okay, so from what I'm understanding, this John Smith was married to your great-grandmother, Sarah Jane. They had three kids. He died. Then James Gillies then went and had a child with, or then went and married Sarah Jane. And then... They had children. They say their first child born. So I'm guessing they had more than one. Um, they did say one. Yeah, okay. Can't find evidence of a marriage certificate for them. Can you help me find Sarah Jane and her parents? So this is a genie straight up genealogy, genealogy question. Um, so we have someone that, that posted, Hi, I might be able to help you out a bit. Ross is well-known old Scottish surname. Could indeed be a given his middle name to one of their offspring. It happened in my Scottish family too. So you're probably looking for a marriage between a Ross and a Carlisle for her parents. Londonderry is in those days capital. Wait, on oh, Carlisle. Okay, yeah. Um, Londonderry is in those days capital of an area of Ireland that is called Ulster. A lot of Scottish people came to that area because of the Ulster plantation in the 17th century. You can find a lot of information on that topic. The websites I use for finding relatives in Ulster. So there's census records, find my past, and then the National Archive uh, of Ireland. So hopefully, hopefully that was helpful for this person. 
Um, and that's kind of, that would be very similar suggestion is basically, you know, what can you find out about the history of the area? So it certainly makes sense with that Ross name uh, coming from Scotland. Um, so the main thing is finding out about Sarah Jane and she was in the U.S. So unfortunately, part of the issue, too, is, you know, the name Sarah Jane. That's uh, that's. Yeah. Uh, the, the, not an easy name to find. Um, and then especially we don't know the, the maiden name. Now, one question I have here is, have you done DNA testing? Because if you've done DNA testing, you might be able to solve this fairly quickly. For one, do DNA testing. C, are you getting matches that have this Ross or Carlisle surname? Um, do you have matches that are coming from the areas that you would expect to find these families? And, um, you know, especially in terms of the Scotland versus Ireland uh, sort of thing. Although I, knowing how admixtures and stuff are, it might be hard to see that, but more in your matches. You know, do you have matches that a lot of them are coming from Scotland and especially, you know, I don't know. Um, all right, let's see what... Uh... Yeah, need a tree screenshot for ones like this. I, I agree, I agree. Um, which I see some people will post stuff uh, with their trees and all that. Um, let's see, let's see what we can find on ancestry for Sarah Jane. So when she came over, when did she come over? So her existence in the 1910 census. Sarah Jane Smith, jeez, <laughs> gosh. Oh. Okay, so Sarah Jane Smith, born eighteen fifty-five. Let's. Sarah Jane Smith, born 1855 in Ireland, died 1926. So let's just see what this has for now. Just, we'll just, we'll make that as specific as possible for right now. And it has, oh, 1,200. Let's see if we can get it down any further. Um, all right, well, let's just see if we can find her one of these trees 1926 exact uh, not her What was, let's double check. Okay, what was the second husband name's Gillies? Let's search Gillies instead of Smith. That's probably the name she went by when she passed. Anna Gillies. Ah. <laughs> All right, let's expand this. Five years. So hopefully this might be somewhat useful for a lot of uh, a lot of folks watching that aren't too familiar with, you know, when you're doing searches, kind of slowly manipulating a search. So basically starting somewhat broad or somewhat narrow, and then getting broader or narrower depending on what you're dealing with. So like with this one, we're dealing with a lot, a lot of matches. So we wanted we started broad, we made it narrow or narrow narrower. And now we've made it too narrow, so now we want to make it broader. But I'm just double checking. Died March 30th, 1926. So this is her. So we've got a distracted death. We know she's in Manhattan. Now, if I had a tree that I was building, this is one of the reasons why it is nice to build on Ancestry is that once you you know go it's like oh this is her okay save and then we can save to uh to our tree but then we also have let's see this 
very unlegible. Uh, but this is Scotland, uh, or uh, not Scotland, registers, yeah, National Records of Scotland, statutory registers, marriages, and when did they get married? Because I think they said it. I don't know, she doesn't say it. All right, so we've got an idea of who. Now let's jump to this tree that's been built for her. Okay, no, this is this is a different person. Oh yeah, <laughs> I totally was not paying attention there. Okay, so let's see if we can find the tree. No oh, tree. Okay, we're gonna try this actually. We're gonna up this to 10 and then we know the spouse's name is Gillies. Okay, so here we've got Sarah, Lyne, Sarah Jane Carlisle. Father Ross Carlisle. So this might be ah. So this is uh, yeah. This is uh, this is our OP's tree. So you in tree. So we do have a lot of uh, information on the children. We have these siblings, which that's one thing I wonder, how much has this person done of what's known as the fan method? Friends, associates, neighbors, basically. Well, some people say family associates and neighbors, but yeah. Basically, research the known acquaintances and friends and, and people that they interacted with including their siblings. So I see there's nothing built out on the siblings. So how much have you built out on the siblings? Um, going back to read what it says. Doesn't say anything about this person researching the siblings. So that'd be one thing I would do. Now let's take a look at what records they have attached. See if maybe we can get an idea of something else that they could. So, all right, we've got... New York Archdiocese of New York records. So this is uh, for a child. We have baptisms. So for child for through her first spouse. Um, let's see. Um, is that? No, they're so... this. No, where is it? Why am I missing this? <laughs> what am I missing? Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay, it's um. Nah. So we're looking for child Herbert. I was looking for female. Okay, so this is so John Sarah Smith Elizabeth Collier by whom okay so not really much information here so basically what this is one of the things i do when if i'm starting out researching a tree that has already been worked on i want to go in and i review everything first off i'm seeing you know does it make sense with what's there you know could this be a record that just same name but different person um and then all right so 1910 is the earliest that they have transport list for a son so yeah so 1910 is the earliest they have so let's see what it says in terms of when they arrived in the u.s because that's that's going to be where my main thought is going to go is when did they arrive and can we find anything so here we have the family we've got james gillies sarah their children marion edward george we show that they're from scotland we show for Sarah that her father is from Ireland and mother is from Scotland. 
we have a naturalization of 1872. No, that's got to be 1892. Because they weren't they weren't in the U.S. in 1872, so this is probably 1892. Or it, so for a second, I was thinking maybe it's 1892, and it's just the rest of that circle for the nine is not there. But what it looks like is it's the wrong date. So there's two possibilities here. Either we're looking at incorrect information on the census, because we know for a fact in the 1880s that they were in uh in, in the uk well i guess it wasn't the uk then but <laughs> they, you know they were they were not they were not in the us so couldn't be them uh or either either the date's wrong or couldn't be them hey what are you doing little dog what are you dogs barking at everyone throw some dog emojis in the chat for the puppy boys uh so okay so if, we, all right well, give me one second i need to let the dogs outside <laughs> let them out back crazy little dogs crazy little dogs i've got all right so Let's take a look, and now we have the 1872 date here. This is the 1910 census. We know Sarah was married before James, so let's look at this information of how long they were married. Well, they were married for 27 years according to this, which means that that would have been 1883, and does that match up with what we know? Uh, not quite. Um, but it says first child born in New York City, 1888. Um, according to this, yeah, that would be true. Assuming that that is their child. Because we know Sarah, Sarah was married in, what was it, 1880s or something? I don't, yeah, so something weird's going on. What, I, I get, there's, I think either they were given a lot of incorrect information or this is something that um, this is something where this is just a family with the same name of Smith coming from the same area, or I guess not Smith Gillies, same name. But there are some oddities going on here that might be telling here because we do know that there were two marriages. So we have this Marion and Gil and George who were the children. So they would have had to have been, yeah, something, something weird is going on here. So I don't know if this is the right family. So this is, this is one of the things that you definitely need to consider when you're going through this information is that you want to make sure that it's matching up and any contradictions you need to you need to solve you need to figure out so with this one you know where i was going to go with it originally was let's find our nat are they naturalized and do they have an immigration year and we have that but it doesn't match up with what we know about the family um you know with what we know and let's i'm gonna jump back to that other page So who's Sarah Jane? So with what we know here, for one, we're not getting a whole lot of information, but you know, it does say that, where is it? Um, okay, so Sarah Jane and John Smith, John Smith dies 1886 at sea. Uh, John and the grand and her great grandfather served together in Queen Victoria's Guard in India. So I'm assuming that her her great grandfather's marriage to Sarah Jane would have been after John Smith's, thus being after 1886. It says their first child was born in New York City in 1888, which does match up with what we're seeing for the census. But I also wonder if maybe she's just getting that from the census 
uh, that, or that's where she's getting the information from the census. But if we were to build out a timeline of these people and the people that are in this census that she has linked to her tree, I would be, I, I, well, not, I would be, I am questioning very much if it is truly the same family. Um, now, granted, I'm coming at it from a top-down scenario where she was coming from a bottom up. Basically, I'm coming from a, I'm building from the ancestor back down. She's building from herself and up. So let's see what. Uh... Okay. I was like, what is this new thing? I have not seen that before, but okay. Um, okay, so. In terms of these kids, too, that's something else to look at. So that's the first Marion. So she has a picture of it, of her. So it must be the, the right thing because it says it. And she's born in New York City. So let's see if we can find her birth certificate through the New York... Um, vital records uh, if I can find it so basically there's a there's a why can't I find this so there's a whole bunch of uh, New York birth records available online now. I'm pretty sure that's this site. Okay, here we go. No. Um, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna find this. I'm gonna find this a different way. <laughs> Um, hopefully I'll be able to, hopefully I'll be able to pull this up in a second, give me a second. So this is a thing, one of the things with genealogy too, there's so many websites and so many things that Sometimes you'll work on a website for a whole long while and then you haven't used it for a while and then you, you know you need to go back to it and you can't remember what the website actually was. Um, I'm mean, going through my list of uh, websites. Where is the NYC? Oh, did they change the page? Is that why it's so... <laughs> oh my gosh. Come on, where is it? I know you're there somewhere. It might be that they changed the website so it just looks different to me now. Is that it? Okay, here we go. Finally. <laughs> oh, it was it, it was kind of the right website, but in a, it was in a different spot than where I originally thought. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. So with this website, which I am going to put in the chat, this allows us to get records for New York. So we're looking for the first daughter of this marriage, so Marion Gillies. So what we're going to do, birth, Gillies, and it doesn't let you choose all at first. Um, so let's see, where was she? I think she was Manhattan, so we'll just do Manhattan first. 
And she was born 1888. So let's see if she pops up. And all right. Right there. Is that it? So we have John Gillies. Name of child. There's no name here. We have a birth date, December 4th, 1888. Does that match up? No, we're looking January 20th, 1888. And then the last name or the, the mom doesn't work. So we're going to go back. Now we're going to take out the year just in case the year might be wrong. But we'll also do all. And I'm going to make it a little bit closer so we don't have to deal with as much extraneous stuff. So let's see. So we've got all these gillies and we're looking for female Marion gillies. 1888 would be the best, but it doesn't seem to be the case. So row. Okay. Now one other thing, let's take a look. Oh wait, we don't have anything showing an address in the 1880s. Um, cause what I'd want to do is also look, you know, what do we have in terms of addresses for the 1880s? Because that 1888 year might be wrong. And if that's the case, we'd be able to tell by the address. So we'll look at 1910, but they may have already moved by that point. So street, so 135th street is all that we get. So they're living at 135th Street. Okay, so we see 135th Street. But I keep seeing James Gillies in this row. Let's see, what's this one? No, more Gilly, yeah. So I'm not finding them in here. Um, now, another question is, where did they get married? Uh, because if they were married in New York, we could have gone through that website and looked. And I'm not going to take a whole lot of time to do a bunch of the, the research for this person. Um, but I just wanted to see if I could find some of that stuff. But it, there are ways to kind of go about it. But I think the DNA would be a great route. Um, all right, let's going to mark this one. I've been going for just about two and a half hours. So I think I'm going to end it soon. Um, I've also noticed the numbers start to drop back down. So, all right, let's check chat. Um, all right, we got we got some dog emojis in the chat for the dogs in the background, which my 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 dog Jack is just still barking up a storm out there. And Petey, come here, Peter, come here, baby boy. He's just been hanging out with me down here. What are you doing? What are you doing, silly boy? Oh, look at you. Look at you. Hey, you're on stream. You're on the stream. So, <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Wow. Yeah, I've been going for two hours and 37 minutes. Jeez. So, all right. Any, any, any last questions or anything from people? <laughs> baby holding <laughs> these dogs Petey look Petey look right there what's that what's that say hello say hello to everybody yeah you're famous you're <laughs> so yeah these two dogs they're so so spoiled such different temperaments <laughs> this doggy he's just like yeah I'm gonna chill my other dog, Jack, he's always, always, always barking up a storm, barking up at all the other dogs. Jackie boy. <laughs> I wonder if I should, if I hold my dog up like this, all the, all the streams where <laughs> it's just an image of the stream. Hopefully people will uh, see the dog and be like, oh, we should jump in there. <laughs> so uh, one thing that uh, one thing that has not been done so far on this stream is, uh, you know, I always have a different background, a different map. 
And I don't know if I've seen anybody guess the map today, which is slightly surprising because I was a little worried that a lot of people would be like, oh my gosh, look at that map. I know that one. Um, <laughs> ever done a dog DNA test? My neighbors have done one on all five of their dogs. I've actually done two dog DNA tests and I have a video about it. So if uh, you go to my channel and here, let me see. Oh, I'm going to pull it up. Good boy. Good pup, good boy. Um, yeah, I have one on my main channel. And uh, what I did was I tested my dogs because they were both rescues. And I wanted to know about the breeds, but more than anything, we thought they might be brothers. And because of that, I wanted to see, were they brothers? So there's the link to that video. Um, so you can go see that I did a DNA test on them and find out, were they truly biological brothers or were they just similar? So yeah needs his own channel yeah they both need their own channel i thought about making like an instagram or something for them because if there's two things that people love on instagram it's half naked women and cute dogs so i figured maybe i'll take the cute dogs <laughs> um but yeah yeah those two they're uh they're they're very rambunctious little boys the marriage and birth were both in 1885. Oh, were you able to uh, were you able to find it, Karma? Um, if you were, definitely post uh, in that that uh, for that person so they can um, find it. That yeah, who's Sarah Jane? Uh, so, hi, Jeannie blogger. Well, hello, Jackie. I shouldn't say I'm not a blogger. I used to be. I'm a vlogger with a V. But yeah, <laughs> thank you. Welcome. Uh, uh, unfortunately, you're jumping in kind of towards the end. We're going to be ending this soon. Um, but thank you for joining every, every little bit helps. Uh, so, but you'll be able to go back and rewatch through. So, all right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's basically going to be it for today. Um, for next week, i I need to come up with something to do for the main channel. Wasn't sure which, what I wanted to do. Um, last week I did the, uh, uh, what was it? The countries. Uh, identifying the countries, doing geography tests. I talked about doing more next week, possibly, but I kind of wanted to try to find something that was a bit more genealogy wise. So the thing that I was thinking was a possibility, and maybe I'll put out a uh, poll for this, was basically building a famous person's family tree live on, on stream from scratch. It's just a matter of choosing that famous person. Um, so I'll need to come up with a decent list. Any ideas of, of good famous people we should build a tree for, let me know. Um, I was thinking stuff like, you know, maybe Abraham Lincoln or, you know, I don't know, something like that. But, um, yeah, so I just need to come up with an idea like that. But, um, for anyone who doesn't know, I'm going to be continuing doing these streams every Friday at two o'clock. It's going to be, uh, th I know this week it's on the professional reaction, professional genealogist reacts channel. Next week will be on Genie Vlogger and it's going to jump back and forth. But I oh, didn't mean to hit that. Hopefully that didn't sound terrible for you all. But hopefully, uh, or not, but hopefully, um, but I also will be streaming all of them through Twitch and through uh, Facebook. Um, and for anyone that wants to catch every single stream I do, because I'm also starting to do gaming streams, uh, go to my Twitch because I do every stream through Twitch. Um, yeah, that'd be a fun stream to do a live one. Yeah, yeah, I think that'd be a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Uh, that Gills family was a prototype for the Genie fa Fairy series, was it? Was that the was that the family that um, was that the family that was the impetus to coming up with that Genie Fairy series? Which, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, the Genie the Genie Fairy series is a series based on the idea of me being the Genie Fairy going around and i guess blessing people <laughs> pretend i have a wand do i have anything to be a good wand um here we'll use my we'll use my uh wiki tree pen as the wand so the going around and blessing and <laughs> blessing people just like yeah <laughs> you get genealogy and you get genealogy and you get genealogy 
Oh, put up the picture. All right, fine. Fine. I'll put up the picture. I'll put up the picture. I just need to find it. <laughs> Genie fairy. Okay, I keep finding it, but now I need to find the original. All right, Maven, where's the original? That's funny. All right, Genie Fairy, maybe like that? All right, here, let's... The famous Genie Fairy image. <laughs> All right, and this will also kind of give everyone a nice little view of the... Uh... I've got... Oh, the feedback channel, okay. Here we go. So this is this is the genie fairy logo. <laughs> now I just I just need to get the muscles up to uh, to to fit. I'm not too far off, but I need to you know need to need to need to need to pump up a little bit to get that that jacked up. <laughs> so the famous genie fairy image. Um, so yeah yeah so we'll uh we'll be doing that i guess i guess for the genie fairy stuff i'll be blessing <laughs> blessing random people um yeah yeah need a tan too i don't tan i basically just impale and then burn that's, that's I, I my process is pale burnt freckle like i don't <laughs> look at like, look at look at these freckles look at these freckles I don't think I have as many on my face though. Yeah, but I'm a I'm a freckly, freckly human being. Not on this side. See, this is the interesting thing. Look at this side. You can see how under my arm, which doesn't get as much sun, doesn't have as many freckles as above. And one thing that I do sometimes is when I'm out, I'll like hold my arms like this. And I notice if I if I like have a week where I think about it and I kind of just do that for a few minutes each day when I'm like outside walking my dogs or something, I'll start to notice more freckle. Like my, my arm seems more freckly. So <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess you could say that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Redheads do not tan. That is not, that's not something we do very well. Not something we do very well. So, Oh gosh what is oh it's my discord i was like what it's all popping off so for anyone who doesn't know we've got a, a wonderful discord going on be sure to join you can see it's very active i literally had just checked pretty much everything this morning and yeah um for anyone who's from the discord if you have the invite link and can post it in chat would truly appreciate that um so yeah let's close that out so all right well <laughs> getting close to getting close to three hours now you should make a channel on discord for suggestions for the celeb trees oh yeah maybe maybe uh maybe i'll do that um yeah maybe we can do that come up with uh polling there to come up with a list that we then release the poll to the larger audience and i could probably pull that through my youtube or something but uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here for the stream. Truly appreciate it, as always. Um, if you haven't yet, be sure to like, subscribe, follow, comment, do, you know, any interaction helps. I mean, even if you dislike it, I think that helps me out anyway. So. Um, but truly appreciate it, as always, and had a lot of fun today. Still haven't heard anybody guess the map in the back, so I guess that's going up on the stream next week, too. Um, but thank you so much. I'm the genie vlogger and I'm out. Oh, make sure to do it this way. I learned, uh, I learned the other way is not so good for, uh, our friends in England. So <laughs> I'm out. Peace. <laughs>